Gino Argento, Baden Bakowski. Here. Lisa Bamanti. Here. Gina Barrows. Here. Eric Rosides. Here. Iris Cabrera. Bill Capronegro. Frank Caboon. Here. Steve Chesler. Here. Michael Chiancelli. Teresa Sincara. Stephanie Cuevas. Juan and Daly. Giovanni D'Amato. Evan Drinkwater. Arthur Dibanowski. Here. Lloyd Fang. Julia Manda Foster. I'm here. The Alice Fuller. Crystal Garcia. Joel Goldstein. Joel Gross. Yeah. David Helmick. Here. Sabrina Help. Katie Danny Horowitz. Here. Sonia Iglesias here. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Here. Bongina Kaminsky. Here. Corey Canton. Here. Paul Kulterborn. I'm here. here. William Clasborn. I'm here. Yolando. Yolando. Okay, it's probably what you're gonna do, probably. Here. Hello. Can you guys please mute yourself? Come on, help me guys, please. Yolo. Trina McCreever. Trina McKeever. Adam Myers. Adam Myers. Adam Myers is here. Thank you. Sante Michelli. Sante. Toby Moskowitz. Rabbi David Niederman. Karen Nieves. Mario Domerick. I'm here. Thanks. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sofa. Del T. Here. William Vega. Maria Vera. Maria. Where are you? I present, saw you. Present. Thank present. you. Simon Weiser. Yeah, you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sure. Gold Gross is here. You hear me? Yes, Mr. Gross. Let me. Okay, yes, I got you. Uh, just double checking. Did you get Frank Carbone? Mr. Frank, yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, Giovanni D'Amato. Thank, Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Mr. Carbone. Anybody Hello, else? David Helmick. David Helmick? Yes. I got you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia, uh, Gina Argento is here. She's having trouble with her uh, audio. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Mary. So we have 27 answer the call, 604. Thank you so much, Thank Sonia. You. Okay. Uh, the first item on the agenda is Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, Diana Romero. Is anybody here to present on that item? Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, I'm Samantha. I think Diana and I are both having some issues with the, our audio. Um, sorry, just give me one moment. No problem.
Sonia, I got a message from Gina Argento. She said, please let her in. She's having trouble getting in. Is she under attendee? Uh, I don't know what she is. No, I don't think so. She's on panelist, but she said you need to let her in. So. She's an attendee then. Okay, Johanna? No, Trina McKeever said she's here, but she's unable to unmute herself. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary. I'm trying to find her. Hi, uh, Sante. I'm also here. I don't know if you called my name before. I'm having a problem. Uh, uh, to yeah, contact. we all are. Today's a crazy day. Thank you, Sante. William Baker here. Thank you, Mr. William. Sonia Phil Caponegro also. Thank you, Phil. Rina's in now. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joanna. Okay, is there anybody in that was trying to get in? Looking at the attendees, I don't know, something went wrong today. It was weird. Okay, uh, Diana, are you ready to start? Ms. Ramiro? Samantha? Can you hear me? Okay. I can't hear. I can't hear anything. We can hear you. Try signing out and signing back in. Sometimes that works. Is uh, that a wonderful thing? Yes, and why here? Is the sanitation department here? Yeah, I'm here. I'm going to log we're out gonna, and then we're going to do the san, uh, sanitation presentation and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, sanitation department. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael. Thank you very much for having me. I am from the department of sanitation. I am our, I am a community affairs liaison. So any issues you do have sanitation related. I did leave my information in the chat so you could feel free to reach out to me and I will be glad to help out on any instances, not just the set out times. But today we wanted to go into our uh, new set out times. It goes into effect on April 1st, 2023. Uh, so right now uh, with this rule, it will, we're looking to reduce the time the trash obstructs the street, making our streets cleaner and we're looking to reduce the rats. Um, for residents, there'll be two options for setting out trash and recycling as well as curbside composting. So if you do have a, a container, you can put it out from 6 p.m. on to midnight. Uh, keep in mind that container does have to be 55 gallons or less with a secure lid. Uh, after 8 p.m., if you'd like to put uh, garbage bags, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, for businesses, you also have two options for setting out those items. You could either put it out in a bin with a secure lid one hour before closing time or after 8 p.m. as well. Um, one moment. We are currently doing a lot of outreach to let residents as well as businesses know. We, we, we like having these conversations with the community boards like you guys and appreciate uh, you guys having us as well. Uh, we are mailing all this information to residents, property managers, and businesses. Uh, we also are trying to reach out to uh, multi dwelling business uh, buildings with like 10 and plus units. And we are doing paid media campaign coverage as well as digital radio and public space advertising. Uh, any further questions, uh, I'm, I'll feel free to reach out to me uh, going forward. You know, you have my number in the chat. Uh, any questions now about this, I'll be glad to uh, take as well. Does anybody have any questions? Madam Chair, it's Sonia. I, I just wanted to be clear. You stated that when they take the black the bags out, what time would that be? Okay, so for a resident, you could put it out after eight p.m. No, because the the residents don't do that normally in the multiple dwellings. It's a super. Yes. And most of them work till like four o'clock. So the all right. So they 
they've been contacted by DSNY, these multi dwelling buildings. Uh, they were given the opportunity to opt into uh, specific guidelines where they could either put it out the morning of at a certain time, uh, or they could go with their usual, uh, you know, they could do that 8 o'clock rule, but the buildings with uh, multi dwellings were definitely contacted and uh, they were given the opportunity to opt into uh, a different set out time. I'm sorry, one more question follow up. Sure. They would have to notify the Department of Sanitation to get into that program to to. So annually, uh, we have an opt in. Uh, it is past that date right now. So anyone who was opt in already that was done on January uh, 31st. Uh, but and there are no exceptions. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. I could try to reach out to a supervisor to see if if there are any people who who do have any questions or want to try to opt in still, if you could accommodate that, but I can't guarantee you anything. But every year they'll be given the opportunity to opt into that special set out time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sure, this is William Vega, my speak. I don't have the race functions, strangely. I'm sorry? Uh, raise, uh, the raise, the raise, the hand raise uh, signals under the on the panelists. You got a hand over there. Go ahead, Vega. I, I don't see it, unfortunately. It's, it's one of those days. But um, we also don't have chat. So if you could give us your phone number. Okay. Uh, the, my office number is two one two, two nine one, twelve twenty. I'm there pretty much Monday through Friday. Uh, there's usually someone there if it's not me who answers the phone uh, between. Uh, 8 and uh, no, uh, 5 p.m. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Michael, could you send us an email to the office and we'll send out all your contact information to the board? Of course, of course. I'll do that tomorrow at work, okay? Thank you so much. We appreciate that. No worries. Any other questions? Yes, Simon, I want to say. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, can I, can I bring up another point? Uh, of course. Uh, not related to this issue. Okay, so uh, I, I, today I received a complaint from a constituent, a CB1. He says that uh, when the trash, when the garbage truck passes by, it doesn't pick up the, house, the trash from the house, um, he's, he's not notified. And then right away in the morning, the inspectors pass by and they give a, a summons. Uh, I myself, I live here in. Uh, in Williamsburg, and a couple of times the, the truck leaves out my specific building because maybe, you know, they're a bit lazy to go. If it's in one car is parked next to each other, they don't want to go around, and they leave the trash behind, and it ends up sitting outside on the curbside till Tuesday. So it's a, it's a multifamily building. You're talking about an hour's work of the super to put it back, to put them back in the in the in the place. So meanwhile, the building's getting a summons for. You know, putting out the garbage too early. So how how what's the what's the what's the mechanism that if this happens that people shouldn't be ticketed? Okay. For uh, so say your garbage. Say you do put out your garbage the night before, uh, and it's your usual collection day. Come that morning, you see the rest of the block is service, uh, and yours wasn't picked up. You could call me at that phone number. I'll be glad to reach out to the district directly for you. Let them know the situation and they will try to accommodate you as soon as possible. Uh, say, um, you know, usually we're given 24 hours to collect the garbage. So say that garbage is not picked up past that time. You're also welcome to call me the next day or 301 and put in a missed collection complaint as well. And that should protect you from any summonses that were issued. Past that 24 hour point. Okay. But, but three one one also you said or did you I'm sorry okay. I clear. So you said it, I... say say your collection day is Monday for instance and you put out that garbage and it's not collected the whole day Monday and it's coming into Tuesday you call three oh one uh once that twenty four hour period ends you could call into three oh one uh say the garbage was missed you get a missed collection complaint you will be given a three one one number say you are given a summons you when you have that summons date you say hey I put in a, a complaint for miscollection on this state, this is you know a miscollection, not me putting it out too late or too early, or anything like that. Okay, but even before right. that, you could give us a call at my phone number that I gave you, and we'll reach out to the district and we'll speak to them directly and we'll try to accommodate it as soon as possible. Okay. Yes, one other point I I want to mention that I 
I, was, I passed uh, one of the streets last week, and I saw that a sweeper had swept the curbside of the of the street, and all the all the trash that was supposed to be, you know, picked up by the sweeper, it it was swept in the middle of the of the of the of the road. Looks like the, you know the broom wasn't working, you know, the mechanical problem. But I mean, the driver of this uh, vehicle should. Uh, Time to time, look in the look in the back and see that nothing was being picked up. It was just sweeping it from the from the side to the center of the street. Okay. Uh, anytime you, you know, do that, you feel free to reach out to me as well. Obviously, in a perfect world, you know that sweep is working perfectly. But we will reach out to a supervisor that uh, handles that area, and we'll try to you know either see what's up with that sweeper and obviously get those items cleaned up as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. Just at the same time, while you're on the phone, I would like just to thank uh, your department, uh, you know, all the heads up that they uh, changed uh, the night cleaning in a, a large portion of, of Community Board 1. They, a, lot of, a lot of streets were the midnight, you know, middle of night cleaning because of the com old commercial blocks. And the last month, the two, last two months, they changed all that to day cleaning, which is... Uh, and it was a long, long project of many years, and thank God we're up to now where everything has been, all the signs have been changed, and thank you very much for the hard work uh, the sanitation department put into this. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I will definitely relay the message to the local district as well as, you know, the higher-ups, okay? Thank you. I have a fast question, Madam Chair, Santi, uh, um, once we have sanitation here. Okay. Um, um, yeah, on, on Milton Street in Greenpoint, I was wondering, is that your competence? Because they've been doing some construction, had been, they've been pouring water all along the block with uh, mixed concrete, probably washing container, stuff like that. And, uh, and all the street is still consistently marked. I was afraid that all this debris could have gone into the the sewer, but I was wondering, is that something uh, normally it regards DOB or it's something they fell under your competence of uh, sanitation? Okay, so it's a, it's like construction being done by uh, like a, there was someone who's doing a building. Or Special something. washing, uh, concrete, they were washing buckets with the oh. concrete were missing, but you know, they've been doing that consistently for a while and you can see the entire half of the block is uh you know was running down you know on the block so so uh it could possibly uh some of that be part of our issue with the cleaning we could help with the cleaning but obviously you know we want them to stop doing that so we may issue some summonses on that part but uh with the water system and and stuff going to the water system that you know that isn't approved of that would probably be a dep issue uh i could try to confirm that for you okay yeah, Milton Street in Greenpoint. So um, uh, you'll see that it's on the left hand side. It's on the Monday and, and Thursday uh, uh, cleaning day. Side. Okay. So, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you very much. Any other questions? Any other questions? No. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for your presentation, and we look forward to the literature. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. You're quite welcome. Have a good evening. You too. Um, Ms. Miro, are you ready now? Yes, hello. I'm, I'm sorry. I had to switch computers for whatever reason. I didn't have any audio. Um, okay, well, thank you for uh, this time. If I could... Um, I don't know if I have the ability to share my screen. Um, I do have a short presentation to help folks with the information. Is that possible? Yes, yeah, so we can give you permission to share the screen. Wonderful. Okay, great. Let me um, let me find my. Here we go. Okay and move something out of the way. Okay, wonderful. So thank you for the time this evening. I'm Diana Romero and I'm a professor at the CUNY School of Public Health. Um, we're up in um, 125th Street in Harlem, part of the CUNY system. 
And the reason why um, I asked if we could present is because we're partnering in a project with the uh, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that um, intends to really engage New Yorkers um, across the five boroughs. And so we've been presenting at CBs uh, for quite some time now um, to try to spread the word about this project. So as you can see here, it's called the Health Equity and Access to Care. Uh, project or HEAC, and I'll just I just have a few slides to give you the the basic information about the project. Um, the health department about a year ago conducted an analysis of state health um, care utilization data, specifically hospital data, looking at um, uh, New Yorkers' use of hospital services, and found very significant differences. What they found, in a nutshell, um, and it wasn't surprising, these are hypotheses that they came in with, was um, they found that individuals um, from uh, communities of color, uh, as well as those with either no or public health insurance, particularly Medicaid, were more likely to use the public or safety net hospitals in the city. And those who identified as white um, and or had private health insurance um, not surprisingly, were significantly more likely to use, um, have utilized services at private hospitals. Um, let's see. Um, so clearly what they saw in the aggregate sort of large scale um, quantitative data across New York City was that there were these um, significant differences in healthcare um, access and, sorry, this delayed here. Um, and what they used were the SPARCS data. Some folks are available with that. It's um, hospital utilization data across the state, but of course they focused in on New York City alone. Now, what, um, you know, there are things that we do and don't know from different kinds of data. And so because the SPARCS data are sort of these quantitative hospital-based data, um, they can be very good for things like I have here, you know, different patient characteristics. Obviously, the analyses that they did looked at racial ethnic identity as well as health insurance status. There's other data like the diagnoses, the treatments they received, cost, all of that, you know, is informative. And what that leads to is sort of like telling us, okay, are there differences across patient groups, sort of the what? And like I said, they did find significant differences by race, ethnicity, and health insurance. But one of the things that these kinds of data can't tell us is sort of explain what's going on or the why. So um, what they were really interested in is trying to sort of dig deeper and get at what are specific factors, specific experiences that people have, which may result in their going to certain hospitals or maybe not feeling that they can go to other hospitals, um, you know, when they're looking to access health care. So what they did is they basically um, reached out to us to see if we could partner in this project where, you know, I'll, I'll highlight here, sorry, um, the focus here is on the qualitative. They have the quantitative data they already looked at, but they really wanted to get qualitatively at, you know, what's going on in the city around what essentially looks like very segregated, you know, healthcare experiences. So since the fall, we, we got going with um, reaching out and conducting focus groups with New Yorkers, uh, at, as I said, across the city. Um, what this says here basically is that between, you know, last year and through fiscal year 2024, this project is envisioned to be ongoing so that we can really enroll and involve rather as many New Yorkers as possible on what's going on in terms of their access and care. Right now we're in this phase right here, phase one, where we're looking at people who identify with a wide range of racial ethnic identities. But what we're really zeroing in on are these two groups here, those with private insurance, versus those with public insurance like Medicaid, because that's where the biggest differences are happening. Um, we, we know that there's a lot of diversity in New York City, and so there is the uh, plan to roll this out to include others. For example, uh, migrants, uh, individuals not uh, born in this country, 
also specially vulnerable groups like uh, indigenous communities, the unstably housed, um, formerly incarcerated. And, you know, we also know that Medicare is a whole nother, you know, entity. Um, and so that will uh, likely just require, you know, specific focus as well. It's a different kind of public health insurance, if you will. But right here in this first phase is what we're trying to target, you know, invite New Yorkers to, to do these focus groups with us. We either have private insurance or Medicaid and get a sense of what their experiences accessing care have been and specifically in the past year. To give you a sense of how we're trying to get the word out, um, you know, we just kind of list here, um, uh, you know, not, in, not a complete, but sort of a, 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 a truncated list of the efforts we've been making. We've reached out to various CBOs. We, um, you know, the, the health department, obviously has grantees and partners with different organizations. They've spread the word that way. Obviously, we're here tonight. We've presented to, I think, seven different Brooklyn community boards, um, as well as in the other boroughs, and we're continuing to do so. We've met with borough presidents' offices, use all sorts of social media, and we're also very happy to go to, you know, in-person events across the city. Um, but importantly, you know, this is not just a one way, um, you know, just get the word out to you all, but we really hope that it can be, you know, a two way conversation because this last bullet here is what's really important is if um, any folks that are part of the community board, as well as in your communication to individuals in the community, if you have any suggestions for how we can continue to get the word out about this project. Essentially, it's focus groups that we are conducting, and I'll just switch over in a second and just show you the flyer so you can get the, you know, the full sense of um, the outreach we're doing. So I'm just going to stop sharing and then just show you the flyer, and then you know, I'm happy to answer any questions and to get your, um, and get your feedback as well. So let me just open the flyer here. Here we go. I know it's probably small, or at least it is on, on my screen, um, but we have this in a few forms. We, you know, we have it um, where we uh, obviously make it available uh, uh, in person at events we go to, but we also send it out electronically to different organizations. And we have a version that can be posted more easily through social media, like on Instagram. Um, but what we're looking for, you know, as long as people live uh, somewhere within the five boroughs of the city and have tried to act either access to care in the past year or try to, but maybe we're not able to access care for themselves or someone close to them. Um, identifying these sort of broad, you know, racial ethnic categories and are 18 years or older. For now, we're doing them in English because um, that's the first phase, but as soon as we move into the phase with uh, non US born uh, different uh, immigrant groups, we will um, expand to do focus groups in different um, languages. And between a URL that people can click on or a QR code that folks can, you know, um, take a picture of or in person, if we go to events and we bring like tablets with us, people can, um, you know, sign on in person. These links will just take folks to like a 10 question survey and that survey will just determine if they're eligible. Like if, if, if all of these, you know, elements are met. Then we follow up with them and schedule them to participate in a focus group. Um, right now, individuals are receiving $40 for their participation, but we're probably going to add a short survey at the end of the focus group. And then that'll be increased to $50 for their time. Um, and at the end of all of this, the hope is that um, the findings from this um, project will be used by the health department to inform both policy and programmatic recommendations around trying to reduce the segregated access to care that um, apparently is currently, you know, in place. So I think I'll stop there. And, and again, if folks have questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm also really eager to know if you have suggestions as to how 
maybe working with you, we can get the word out to the community um, and what you think would be, you know, different ways that might um, be able to involve as many people as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions or suggestions? Anybody have any questions or suggestions? Chair, can the presentation be sent to the board? Pardon me? Can the presentation be sent to the board? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think um, I have my colleague, Samantha Wexer, I think is on here, and I think she may have sent it um, in, a, you know, in advance of this meeting, but we can certainly send it um, Great. If again. I missed it, I apologize. No, no, it's okay. Um, we, we can certainly send it uh, this presentation. I'm happy to send to you and and, you know, the flyer is really what will get folks that that's the path for them to kind of get to the screen or to let us know if they want to be um, involved in a focus group. I wonder if that's something that uh, does the community board like post these kinds of announcements on the website or send out newsletters, emails, that kind of thing where we might be able to include it. You know, send us the whole package. We'll put it on our. We'll send that on e on our e list and our board member list. Wonderful. Any other questions or suggestions? Any other questions or suggestions? Uh, this is, hi, this is Caroline Kwan from the EPA. I thought a, a, bit, a good suggestion is we do a lot of like uh, outreach program for our own, you know, project. I think that, you know, in, in if this is specific to New York City, uh, the NYCHA building, there's a lot of occupant. Uh, so maybe you want mind to reach out to the New York City uh, housing, uh, post these flyer uh, on their bulletin board. So people, everyone has the smartphone now. They could scan the QR code and do the survey on their phone or something, you know what I mean? Or help, uh, you know, someone do it. So I think posting that fly, you said it was the key. I think, uh, you know, having a physical fly for people to look at, uh, you know, church groups and things like that, you know, uh, I mean, you know, in New York City, just so many things going on. So I think that, you know, these locations, uh, 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 you know, supermarket, Absolutely. maybe supermarket and things like that, you know, like people who go, these location people are, are shopping there, that they, they see, you know what I mean? So if there's any, uh, you know, bulletin board they could post in these locations where people shop and attend function event, religious event or anything, you know, but yep, I think the yep, New York yep. City NYCHA building is, is big. That those are big keys. Uh, sure. And yeah, the tenants and I think the tenant association presidents might be the way to. Yeah. So I definitely appreciate that recommendation. Maybe you could have the health and high schools posted for you also. I like that for you. Yeah, the thing is, um, health and hospitals, like we're looking for like a broad um, swath of folks and health and hospitals already is, those are public hospitals. So we're, we're trying to kind of go to the community where there might be folks who, who go to H&H &H hospitals, but they may also go to other hospitals as well, um, just to kind of keep it sort of as diverse as possible. You know, well, you got a lot of people that go to the hospitals because that's what the survey said. You know, people don't go to uh, private hospitals; they go to the health and hospitals. Right, right. So we're we're looking to recruit from both sets to kind of do a, a good comparison. So we would include them, but we'd also want to reach out to places where people may go to private hospitals, so we could get a better sense of like what is driving whether they go to one or the other. I think all the suggestions are good. Any That's other great. Much or suggestions. Hearing none. Thank you so much, Diana, for your presentation. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye bye thank now. Bye. Next item on the agenda is one thirty six Franklin Avenue. Christina. Room Krishna Studios. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Thank you for having us. Uh, I guess if you could give us permission to share, we'll share our screen and our presentation.
Sorry, in order to share my screen, I have to quit and come back in. Sorry about that. I'll be right back. Okay, since he has to go out and come back in, I understand uh, Marissa is here from Senator Gonzalez's office. Would you like to speak now, Marissa? Hi there, thank you so much. The Senator actually will be on later during the elected officials section. Uh, so I'll just wait for her update then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, since we're waiting for him, let's go to the uh, Newtown Creek Superfund update. Hi, uh, my name is Caroline Quand. I'm one of the remedial project manager for Newtown Creek. I'd like to introduce my team. Uh, you see that we have Rapika could do on the on video. Uh, she's another project manager for Newtown Creek. She will do the presentation on the update of Newtown Creek. And again, thanks for the invite. Uh, to present the update for uh, the CB1 group. I uh, also wanted to introduce uh, Mark Schmidt. Uh, Mark, could you put yourself on video, I guess? Uh, and speak. So maybe that's, uh, he is another mm -hmm. project manager uh, for Newtown Crete. Hi, everyone. And also we have Stephanie Vaughan. She is our section chief. Uh, for Newtown Creek, Stephanie. Did we lose you? Uh, the next person is uh, Nanny Loney. She is our community involvement coordinator uh, for Newtown Creek with the EPA. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. So again, uh, with Pika could do, uh, we'll be doing the presentation for the Newtown Creek. Thank you, with Pika. I do have a lot of information to get through in a lot of time, so we've got a lot of static. We can understand what you're saying. Okay. Very choppy, the repeater. It's choppy. Okay, hold it. I'm not sure. I'm connected to my Wi Fi. It's a bit better now. Oh, Repika is having connection problem. She can't connect. So is it, we, we have an administrator to let her in or something, or is this? Go out, she's trying to get back in. Right. I'm searching for her. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted, this is Stephanie Vaughn. I just wanted to let you know I am on. I just wasn't able to unmute before. Oh, sorry about that, guys. You got the other presenter on now. Now they're having issues. I'll call you when they finish. Okay. Thank you. I see Rapika's name in in the as a as a panelist. So she looks like she's still there, but. If you're here, if you're hearing us, Rapika, we, we can't hear you at all. She could hear, but she cannot. Uh, could you ask them to make, make them? Uh, she can't unmute. That's why you have to okay. unmute her. Yeah, someone have to unmute her. What is her name? Uh, Rapika Katu, K E T U. But she's under panelists. I don't understand. Right, yeah. She's on the panelist already. She's gonna try to get show her as attendees, that's why. She she uh she got out. Yeah, she's coming back in now. She, let me she's gonna try again to re sign in. Okay, she's back in. Let's see what happens. She's showing as an attendees. Could someone like move her back to the panelists? I guess. Yes, we're working on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry about that. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Better? Okay. Um, can someone give me the ability to share my screen, please? Yeah, you are now the presenter. Yeah, but the share button is still grayed out. I just gave you the permission. Okay. I'm not able to share if someone else from EPA and share the presentation. It still says I can't share content. I think it's your device, because if you double check your device, I think it's your device. If you're using your laptop or device you're using, I think that's the issue. That's a device. Okay, now, now I'm the presenter, so now I can, I can take that, okay. All right, let me try this again. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? And can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, you're good. All right, um, so yeah, I'm gonna give a quick overview on the Newtown Creek Superfund site. Um, and yeah, my name is Rapika, I'm one of the project managers and I work with Caroline, Mark, and Stephanie on the site. So Newtown Creek is a 3.8 mile um, tidal water body. It is a tributary of the East River, um, and it forms a portion of the border between Brooklyn and Queens. It's designated by New York City as one of the um, six significant maritime and industrial areas, um, and it's part of the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary. So um, before I get into the site itself, I wanted to do a brief um, overview of Superfund. So uh, in 1980, Congress established the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA for short, 
in response to toxic waste dumps such as Love Canal and Valley of Drums. These toxic waste dumps received national attention when the public learned about the risks to human health and the environment posed by these contaminated sites. Um, and so CERCLA, which is informally called Superfund, is a program that's administered now by the Environmental Protection Agency in cooperation with state and tribal governments. And the goals include protecting human health and the environment by cleaning up polluted sites, involving communities in the Superfund process, and working with responsible parties to clean up the Superfund sites. Um, and cleanup itself is a multi-step process that I'll go through on the next slide. And our goal is to make sure that the community is included throughout the entire cleanup process. So uh, Superfund has multiple steps associated with it. Um, there's assessment, characterization, selection of remedy, cleanup, and post-construction. Uh, the assessment phase consists of the discovery of the contamination once EPA discovers contamination at the site, we do some preliminary studies and inspections to see whether it should become a Superfund site and if it meets the Superfund um, criteria. If it's determined uh, that the site does pose a risk to people in the environment, then it's listed on a list called the National Priorities List and receives um, funding for cleanup. Uh, once the site is listed on the NPL, EPA characterizes it uh, by studying the nature and extent of contamination. EPA studies what the contaminants are, where they're present, and how they move around. This allows EPA to develop a comprehensive understanding of the contamination and develop a conceptual site model. And during this stage, EPA also assesses risk to human health and ecological health. Um, this information then allows us to conduct a feasibility study, which is also part of characterization here. Um, and as part of the feasibility study, EPA evaluates different actions and cleanup methods that can be taken to clean up the site. Um, once we conduct that study, then during the selection of remedy phase, um, EPA recommends a preferred remedy and presents the cleanup plan in a document called the proposed plan, which is available um, for public review and comment. Once EPA decides on the cleanup method, then we issue something called a record of decision or ROD for short. And um, a ROD is a legally binding decision document that outlines the cleanup specifics. Once the ROD is issued, EPA moves ahead with implementing the cleanup the cleanup phase involves development of detailed cleanup plans, followed by construction and implementation of the plan. And those steps are called the remedial design and remedial action over here, if you guys can see my cursor. Um, and once that's completed, once the work is completed, then EPA periodically checks to ensure that the cleanup method is functioning properly, um, which can involve like routine monitoring and reviews of the site and enforcing any uh, long-term site restrictions, such as institutional controls. And community engagement occurs throughout uh, the entire cleanup process. At this point, we are in the characterization phase for Newtown Creek. A brief history of Newtown Creek. So um, Newtown Creek uh, was, one of, was once one of the busiest industrial areas in New York City. Uh, it was lined with heavy industrial facilities, uh, including oil refineries, petrochemical plants, fertilizer and glue factories, sawmills and lumber and coal yards. In 1856, New York City began dumping raw sewage directly into the water. The creek was crowded with commercial vessels, including large boats, bringing in raw materials and fuel and taking out oil, chemicals and metals. During World War II, the creek was one of the busiest ports in the nation. Um, and to this day, industrial, commercial, and municipal facilities still operate along the creek. Newtown Creek was listed on the, um, sorry, Newtown Creek was listed on the national priorities list in September of 2010. Six respondents signed an administrative order on consent in 2011 to conduct the remedial investigation and feasibility study under EPA oversight. And the study area itself is defined as um, the water and sediment of Newtown Creek and its tributaries up to and including the landward edge of the shoreline and including any bulkheads or riprap containing the water body or to the ordinary high water mark where those are not present. And the study area itself has two units. So we divide it up into operable unit one, which is the entire study area um, where work is currently underway and expected to be completed no sooner than 2023. And then there's also operable unit two, um, which evaluated the impacts of the current and reasonably anticipated future discharge of Superfund site related chemicals of potential concern from combined sewer overflows to the study area. 
Um, a focus feasibility study for that area was prepared by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection with EPA oversight and a record of decision was signed for that unit in 2021, which I'll um, get into a little later. This here is the site map. Um, so this is Newtown Creek, the entire study area. As you can see, it has multiple uh, tributaries, Dutch Kills, Well Creek, Maspeth Creek, East Branch, and English Kills. Uh, to the north is Queens, and to the south over here is Brooklyn. These are the current, uh, this is the current list of potentially responsible parties that we have identified. So um, there are certain responsible parties that are currently the performing PRPs. They're the ones that are doing the remedial investigation and feasibility study under EPA oversight. And then here in recently named, we have, um, you know, these are the recently named PRPs. And, and we're throughout the whole process, we're constantly um, searching for other parties that are responsible for the contamination. Some of our partners include the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in terms of community involvement, we do have a Newtown Creek Community Advisory Group, and it serves as the focal point for exchange of information among the local community and EPA. Uh, and it provides community input on the site and they hold monthly meetings to discuss progress of cleanup. And we regularly attend those meetings. Uh, we present on topics that the CAG requests from us. Um, and it's really a great platform for anyone living in the area to get involved and learn more about the site. The remedial, so um, right now we're in the remedial investigation and feasibility study phase of the site. So the remedial investigation itself consists of doing a site background, uh, characterizing the nature and extent of contamination, assessing risk to human health and, and um, ecological health, um, figuring out what the sources of contamination are, and then fate and transport of contamination, which involves looking at how the contaminants move around and where they end up. The contaminants of concern uh, for sediment at this site include polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, hydrocarbons, copper, lead, and dioxins and furans. This is a general conceptual site model, which can be a lot to take in, um, but it kind of shows the different uh, mechanisms at play in the creek that might <clears throat> cause the sediment to move around. Um, we have different sources over here, like CSO outfalls, stormwater outfalls that could be contributing to contamination or, or discharging contaminants into the creek. Um, and then we also have, you know, the tidal exchange oops, with the East River. Hold on, let me go back. Um, and so th this is developed during the remedial investigation phase based on all the data that we collect um, and so that we can, you know, see what's essentially going on at the site. In terms of um, remedial investigation related tasks, we completed field work um, between 2012 and 2019. The human health risk assessment was approved in 2018. The ecological risk assessment was approved in 2018 as well. And the remedial investigation report um, is about to be approved in uh, early 2023. Um, so it's that report has been completed. Um, you know, we're just doing our final check and we will we will be approving that uh, all right report. And in terms of modeling, the final modeling results memo was approved in December 2022. And currently the chemical fate and transport model is under development. Uh, here's some of the data that we collected. I'm not gonna go through all of it, um, but basically we collected data on like groundwater discharge, point source discharges, pore water, biota tissue, um, and, and some of this data is still being collected um, and it includes like non aqueous phase liquids, ebullition, which is uh, like a, a mechanism of the creek, kind of like a bubbling mechanism, which causes sediments to um, or contaminants to like move around within the sediment in the creek. Um, and then we're also doing a, a groundwater, a lateral groundwater investigation at the moment. So um, the, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the human and ecological risk assessments. So in terms of human health, unacceptable risks to human health uh, were found 
um, to be resulting from consumption, consumption of fish and crab. And the primary risk drivers are PCBs and dioxins and furans. So we have signs posted up around the creek um, not to consume the fish and crab in the creek. Um, and then in terms of ecological risk, some of the tributaries listed here are primary areas of elevated risk, and they're associated with the with PCBs, copper, uh, lead, and dioxins and furans, the contaminants I mentioned before. And risks are elevated for benthic macroinvertebrates, bivalves, blue crab, fish, and birds. And so at this site, sediment is the primary media of concern. So um, now that we're in the final stages of the remedial investigation and it's, um, it's almost approved, we're working on the uh, feasibility study as part of the site too. So the general feasibility study process consists of reviewing the remedial investigation report and refining the conceptual site model, which is the model I showed earlier, um, identifying applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements, which can be um, state or federal laws that we need to um, adhere to when we're doing the cleanup, uh, developing remedial action objectives, developing preliminary remediation goals for the site, um, and then conducting a formal evaluation and comparison of remedial alternatives. And so all of these together form the basis for EPA to propose its preferred remedial alternative or, or cleanup method uh, for public review and comment. So during the feasibility study itself, um, we develop and screen different alternatives um, according to these nine criteria here. And so we do an analysis of the nine criteria um, and we look at things such as cost and effectiveness, uh, short term and long term community acceptance, state acceptance, um, you know, whether it's complying with the ARARs and, um, you know, whether it's improving human health and the environment. And so once we, we do that development and screening, um, we then put our preferred cleanup method into a proposed plan. And we present that plan to the public and hold a public meeting as well. And so then the public usually has 30 days to comment on that proposed plan and, and the um, cleaned up method that we're proposing. Based on the feedback that we receive in our review, we then put our final um, cleaned up method into the record of decision, which then sets the stage for the actual cleanup to happen. So here's the current um, projected schedule for operable unit one, which is the entire study area. So uh, between 2022 and 2024, we're conducting the lateral groundwater study um, and the Newtown Creek group, which is also the um, performing responsible parties that we identified, um, they're going to be conducting an, another sampling program. Um, here we have finalized the RI report, which is very close and continue to work on the feasibility study. Um, in 2025, we'll have a submittal of the draft feasibility study report after the additional field work is completed because that data will feed into it. In 2026, we expect to have a revised draft FS report after EPA reviews it, usually goes back and forth for, for some comments. Um, we look at it very closely. And then in 2027, we're anticipating um, a proposed plan. 2028, we hope to have a record of decision. Um, this is scheduled, this is subject to change. You know, it's um, updated on a regular basis, uh, depending on the progress of the work. Um, once we do have a record of decision, though, uh, we, we have to develop a new enforcement instrument um, for the responsible parties to implement the remedial design and remedial action. And so um, CERC law requires a, a judicial consent decree for remedial action settlement, um, and EPA may consider an administrative order for remedial design in appropriate situations. Once we have the enforcement instrument, then we can complete the remedial design and then go ahead and implement the cleanup. So um, we're also doing an early action in one of the tributaries of the of Newtown Creek. Um, and so we are focusing on the East Branch and we're calling it the East Branch Early Action. Um, and so basically EPA uh, guidance provides for the abil ability to take an interim action or early action at the site. This can be done before the RAFS for the site or operable unit. Um, and so East Branch itself is a tributary of Newtown Creek. It's about half a mile in length. The surface area is about 10 acres. It's 10.3 to 16.5 feet deep in the channel. Um, 
shallower at the head of the tributary. And um, we've done extensive investigations in this creek as part of the RI and FS. So um, to speed things up a little bit, we're doing a focus feasibility study for the East Branch. Um, and currently we have approved a work plan for that focus feasibility study, and we're currently developing an alternatives memo, um, which will outline the different alternatives to consider um, before we select the final cleanup method. We hope to have a draft focus feasibility study uh, by summer 2023 and a final one by the end of 2023. Um, and then um, we have a contaminated sediments technical advisory group that will also be meeting with to go over the site um, and the early action that we're proposing. And then um, between 2023 and 2024, we're hoping to have the proposed um, plan for the early action. And then in 2024, we're hoping to have a record of decision. And so earlier I mentioned um, operable unit two. And so operable unit two, um, is uh, it's outside of, outside of the Superfund process. New York City is basically under an order uh, by the state of New York to implement the long term uh, to implement a long term control plan to control combined sewer overflows. So when that plan is fully implemented, it will reduce the volume of combined sewer overflow discharges to the creek by sixty one percent from the baseline conditions considered in the control plan, um, and is required by their order. Full implementation is expected by twenty forty two. So what we did for OU2 was basically evaluate the impacts of the current and reasonably anticipated future discharges of the Superfund site related chemicals um, from the combined sewer overflows in an FFS. And um, in a record of decision in 2021, we decided that um, for the combined sewer overflow discharges, we would require uh, regular monitoring and reporting. So we're working with New York City on that. Um, and so here's a description of the required monitoring. Uh, we're requiring New York City to sample the discharges from at least four of the major combined sewer overflows. Um, I'm not sure if how clearly you guys can see the figure here, but the CSO discharges um, are these yellow, uh, these yellow dots here with the cross through them kind of. Um, and we're also requiring them to sample other point source discharges to the creek review watershed wide metrics, such as discharge volumes to the creek and the frequency of overflows. Um, and initially we're asking them to do this sampling for two years, but it's possible that it will be extended. Um, and the frequency and components of the monitoring may be adjusted based on the results. Um, and then I just wanted to also mention um, that uh, EPA is currently reviewing um, the Army Corps New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries focused area feasibility study. Um, and so we're reviewing uh, the impacts of the potential plan on the site, um, but comments, I believe, from EPA in general are due uh, around March 8th. So we're still looking at that report and uh, don't have any comments at this time. But um, I know I went through that really fast. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And I can always go back to a slide if you know I went through too fast or something. But thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Rapika and Caroline and um, all the EPA team for uh, presenting tonight. That was really, really great uh, overview. A whole, a whole arc of the uh, of the project. Um, yeah, I just had a, a couple of questions um, related to the potential human hazard. Is there any issues with vapor? See, someone was either on the shoreline or you know on on the water in um, some sort of you know paddling craft that um, there's a danger of them, you know, interacting with uh, vapors that are a result of the ongoing or legacy uh, substances that are in the in the creek. Um, no, we have not identified any uh, risks associated with vapor at this site. Okay, it's good to know. Yeah. Um, and then regarding enforcement, uh, talk a little bit more just what you're going to enforce with the potential responsible parties. Are they and like, what is their involvement in the physical remedy beyond cost? Are they going to be involved in the management information of the remedy? Um, that's a role there. If you could um, elaborate on that. 
Right, so um, they'll be responsible for implementing the cleanup um, and monitoring the cleanup as well uh, to make sure that the remedy is functioning effectively. And Mark or Caroline, if you have anything. Let me clarify. What we have with them, uh, with the NCG in, in New York City, is a consent order that was signed back uh, 10 years ago. Uh, to implement the remedial investigation and feasible study of the OU1, the entire Crete. So that is what we have so far. And under the OU2, uh, we do have a consent order with New York City to implement the combined sewer overflow monitoring program based on the OU2 record decisions. So now, uh, any design or any implementation of the construction cleanup after we issue a record decision on the early action or even on the OU1, the entire Crete, we will have to, like Rupika said in one of the slides, we will have to do a judicial consent decree uh, for the remedial design slash remedial action. If we are just doing design, then we could probably go with uh, 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 an administrative order. But any Implementation of, of cleanup, construction cleanup, got to be a judicial consent decree. So again, that is not hot happening yet because we haven't have a we don't have a record decisions on how we're going to clean up, you know, the early action or the OU one yet. So that is later on the, the enforcement part uh, of the you know uh, design and cleanup. Yeah. Okay, so, so once, general, once generally you get speaking. To that phase, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, so generally speaking, there's potential responsible parties are in, um, responsible for the implementing the remedy, but um, I guess there's still, but what the full role is is still being worked out. Is that um, so? Um, there are basically different legal instruments for like different phases of the Superfund process. So where we are now, they're doing um, the remedial investigation and feasibility study um, in accordance with an administrative or order with EPA oversight. So we're you know reviewing any work plans that they develop, any technical reports, like we review them and approve them. Once mm -hmm. we do get to the stage where we are able to decide on a cleanup method and we issue the record of decision, um, then we will need a new legal instrument basically to make sure that they can implement it. So we're, we're not there yet, but that's part of it. They, it's just like a different um, order or, or consent decree that we have to put um, in place with them to make sure that they do the cleanup. And, and we're involved in that step too, like with our oversight and everything. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And just, I just want to make uh, one final uh, remark is that regarding OU2 uh, tonight, um, during our meeting, uh, the board is going to be voting on the uh, response to the Army Corps HATS storm risk management plan. And one of the re recommendations we're making is that, you know, the 61% reduction in the CSOs, as many finds is, is very, you know, is significant, obviously, but it's, we feel it's really inadequate. So since the Army Corps is suggesting they need to implement, you know, drainage and that those types of measures, if they you know, um, install a you know a surge gate across the mouth of the creek, that we're recommending they invest um, in infrastructure to get that number way up, maybe in the 90s. I know, like in London on the Thames, they built a 15 mile long retention tunnel, and that'll reduce the sewage there by 94 percent. So um, we're hoping that this challenge is an opportunity for you know the the Army Corps and other the partners to improve on that in that uh, that remedy. So, uh, thank you very much again, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Thank you so much, Caroline and Rapika, for your presentation. Have a good evening. Thank you. you too. You're welcome. Okay, uh, 136 Franklin Avenue. Are you ready now? Yes, thank you. Can you uh, make me the presenter so I may share my screen? Okay. 
Thank you. So we're working at 136 Franklin Street. Uh, it's mid block between Milton and uh, Greenpoint Avenue. Um, we're working on a extension at the rear of the building for the first floor space that used to be residential and is now being converted back to commercial. Um, it's going to the storefront will harken back to the 1940s um, tax photo. And that's all been approved by the Landmarks Commission. Um, we're coming to you tonight for the extension because there is some partial visibility from Milton Street. Um, as you all know, um, buildings at uh, 142 and 140 um, Franklin Street uh, have a one story extension already. Um, and it's really only going towards Milton Street that there is not a lot of um, existing first floor extensions. Um, right now, we're on this presentation, we're showing the view that was uh, as of August of last year in a more current view. Um, there's now this outdoor structure that is apparently not legal that is in uh, 132 Franklin Street or 130 Franklin Street, sorry. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to show you the different views from Milton. Um, this is a sheet that shows the mock-up that was constructed. Um, the height of the extension uh, will be the same height of the existing first floor at about 12 feet, and then we'll have a guardrail above that because the roof of that extension will be used by the second floor residential unit. Uh, we're look, working with Landmarks on exactly the design of the guardrail to make it less noticeable. The extension that we're proposing, let me sorry, I just want to get to the part where we have the finish colors, will have a um, reddish brick stucco color to also try to blend it into um, the, uh, the buildings here on Milton, so it'll have the same um, color here, and you can see it's a very minimal um, view from Milton Street. Um, the first floor space will be used as retail, um, and um, you know, I get. Let me just go to the next one where we have like our section. So this is um, the section through the. Building uh, this area here being Franklin Street, this being the rear extension. Um, this kind of illustrating the height of the extension itself and the guardrail. Um, yeah, I think you know ultimately it, it's a it's a very minimal um, view and sightline from Milton, and we don't think it will detract from. Uh, the rest of the uh, the buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, this area has the commercial overlay, so all of the the zoning um, and extension is as of right from a, a zoning standpoint in a in a um, building code occupancy standpoint. Um, yeah, I, I mean I, that's I think that's the long and the short of our presentation, and I would. Welcome any questions that the community board may have. Uh, Steve Chastler, is that hand up from before or now? I uh, know I took it down and re-raised it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, will the roof of the addition be used for, you know, for commercial purposes? No, not at all. It, it's actually a terrace for the residential unit. Okay, that's why we're putting the uh, guardrail. Okay, got you. Okay, and then the um, you're showing consideration from Milton Street, but what about the rear yards within the historical donut? You know, the just the convergence of all the rear yards within the historic district. Um, shouldn't the um, you know the the respective from those those properties be uh, factored in in terms of the 
aesthetics of the of the edition. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not sure what you're asking or explaining. Well, the like the you're showing us what the edition, the view from Milton Street will look like. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm wondering what about from adjacent rear yard, rear yards of property, like on uh, like the backyards on Milton Street. Um, so most of the most of these properties have, you know, this this is I guess the best I can do in terms of that kind of shot. Um, most of the properties have fences, um, and that really like if you can see, I don't know if it's very clear. Let me see if I can zoom in a little. Um, so this is kind of looking back at that. I think the donut you're describing. Um, there there are quite a few um, extensions along. Greenpoint Avenue, uh, I think obviously Milton has a few less, um, but um, I, I don't know that we are um, detrimental to uh, to what's there currently. Well, it's been a kind of a bone of contention on um, you know, this board with our historic district. So I know it has been with the Landmarks Preservation Commission um, as well. So. Um, I mean, it would be up, I guess, for further discussion in, in, the, in the landmark subcommittee. Is there but, something? Uh, sorry, is there something to suggest that you have, you would you would suggest, or, or um, I would? Well, it's kind of, first of all, yeah, we don't have answer. renderings of what it'll look like, so that's kind of difficult. But in terms of, you know, just uh, fitting in contextually, fitting in with, you know, the buildings and um, that make up that kind of backyard donut configuration. I think that's, you know, I think under other circumstances outside of historic district as a landmark building, um, there's a, you know, a, a less significance there, but within the Greenpoint historic district, I think it is an issue when you have connecting um, historic you know properties within that district. I mean, I, I think a lot of, um, oh, sorry. You know, a lot of this is already, this area is really built up. This one actually, you know, goes the full length as well. Um, I mean, I, I think it would be somewhat uh, different if, you know, the extension was happening on Milton. Um, but Franklin Street, it, it's, it's commercial, um, you know, and there are other adjacent um, extended buildings. Okay, well. Uh, we can we can dive in deeper in, in committee. But, uh, thank you. Michele. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, Sante Micheli here. Um, just to clarify, I love to add on um, to what Steve was saying because I'm a resident of Milton Street. I also represent uh, beyond the fact of being community board, also the Milton Street Brook Association. And, um, and and Chesler knows very well because we've been involved, uh, I believe, you know, for 98 Greenpoint Avenue in the past. The community has expressed, uh, both the community board has expressed recognition of the historic donut and the blocks uh, uh, has been very active along the years. I believe the attempt uh, to alter uh, the integrity of this donut uh, that is pretty intact to at least in this western portion you know has been a pretty intact donut except there was a a, a president with a 98 uh, greenpoint avenue uh, but from milton street and uh, you show the picture you see uh, uh, we know very well what is happening there that structure that you mentioned it's illegal under and thirty franklin uh, the, there is a, a, a stop work order they're gonna have to go to court uh, i some of the neighbors sent me a link a, a while ago. Uh, you know, there have been many attempts illegally and legally uh, uh, to alter this donut, which are very uh, sacred. The, there is a sanctity, you know, in this donut. Uh, they also represent green space, which are very important uh, today in the city. And we've been eroding little by little. And, but the difference from something else uh, uh, on Greenpoint Avenue that, that is very particular for Milton Street is this thoroughfare 
they uh, give allow to have a vision of the astral building, which is an astonished landmark at the corner of Greenpoint Avenue. You see from Milton Street, you see through the block into Greenpoint Avenue. You know, while maybe on the upper part of Greenpoint Avenue, they've been historically, you know, there's not that they were, they were part, uh, uh, they were even not a stanchion, where buildings were standing all the way for the entire uh, lot. Uh, I believe this will be a concern and, uh, and and will be a concern for the community, but it will be a concern definitely also, you know, I'm assuming for our uh, uh, committee, you know, and uh, and of course, as Steve said, we, we, we don't see rendering, there is no, but beyond rendering or not rendering, uh, the sanctity of this donut uh, is, will be altered. And the property between uh, uh, the Greenpoint Avenue, I don't remember which is the number, will be locked in by these two structures, you know, and there, there is a backyard. There will be a, a, a sinkhole between those two buildings. So those are the comments, uh, uh, and I can only point uh, uh, criticism uh, uh, to any extension that will take place on, uh, on Milton Street, on Greenpoint Avenue, and will you know, alter this donut forever, you know. I have no thank question. You. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me just make clear, this is purely a landmarks application? Yes. Okay. Um, now, when you come to the committee meeting, we will need better renderings. This is it's very difficult to really see what, you know, the answer to the people's questions here. And have you been working with landmarks on the yes. issues that they're raising with respect to the rear yard? Uh, that hasn't that hasn't come up with landmarks. We're actually meeting with them again tomorrow. I I mean, obviously, I don't know if they, I don't know if anyone from landmarks is attending tonight's meeting. Uh, but we'll we can bring it up. We can bring up your concerns when we meet with them tomorrow for sure. Okay, also, Dale, this is not as of right. Uh, this, uh, you know, we'll have to go through a public hearing. It's definitely, you know, uh, historically there is an intact donut. There's been always an issue and a concern of LPC. And that's why they are here tonight. I believe they've been approved the storefront. They reverted to whatever there was historic uh, uh, in nine, before 1940. Of course, we have lost another residential unit, but I'm assuming the building has been sold for three million and seven hundred thousand dollars. So uh, you know, we probably they're trying to monetize and uh, and speculate also on 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 that space. But it's not as a right there, you know. And I, I would just clarify. I mean, from a from a zoning in a building code standpoint, it is as of right. The the reason why we're we're having to go through the uh, public public hearing process is because of the view from Milton Street. Right. I'm I'm just curious that you haven't um addressed this issue with landmarks. The issue being the donut? Yes, and, and the rear yard and the effect on the donut. I as I said I, we're meeting with them tomorrow again. I will I'll definitely bring it up. It'll clearly be be, be uh, raised at the committee meeting. Who is it that's working on work that you're working with on at Landmarks? What's the name of the person? Let me just pull it up. I don't want to get the name wrong because we're working with several people on different things. Yeah, it is Maggie and Jared. Maggie, you don't have a last name. Uh, sorry. No last name. I sorry. I'm looking at it because um, it's it's not easy for me to say. Okay. Um, me M E I K E I H U I. Okay. Thank you. Of course. And it's Jared Knowles. Can you please send this presentation uh, to the office um, um, after tomorrow? Um, so. You know, we can receive it. Also, we can give it to the to the block association. We sent previously, but we can send it again for sure. Oh, you sent it already. Okay, perfect. Yep. We will ask uh, the office. We, we yeah. generally ask for renderings of what this is going to look like, and uh, pretty you know detailed renderings. Okay. 
All right. Okay. So the the meeting, the next meeting um, will be March sixth, six thirty p.m. Is that? That's the committee that's the, meeting. That's the land use landmarks committee meeting. I thought tonight was a combined land use community board meeting. No, this is the this is the full board meeting. You have oh, that's right. There, okay. to the land to the landmarks land use landmarks committee meeting that's on March March sixth. Also WebEx six thirty. Okay. Thank you. Eighty. Oh, thank you. I actually, um, Del just answered my question. I'll put my hand down. Okay. Is there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Next item on the agenda is 599 Johnson Avenue. 599 Johnson Avenue, is anyone here to present on that item? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Uh, this is Phil Dorn, attorney with Kazetsky and Bookman. I just wanna make sure that Ruth Chopra also uh, is a panelist, I see his face. Yeah, we're good to go, all right. Um, like I said, I'm Phil Dorn, attorney with Kazetsky and Bookman. With me is Drew Chopra. Drew is the owner of Elsewhere, uh, many of you may know him. Drew was in front of the licensing committee in January uh, for an application to slightly expand the footprint uh, of his ex existing uh, space over on, um, on Johnson Avenue. Uh, the alteration will be just to add a minor amount of space to the indoor portion of his premises, uh, including the cellar storage uh, area where no patron patrons have access. Uh, no space is being added to the outdoor portion whatsoever. Um, I also just wanted to clarify that contrary to what tonight's agenda states, the hours of operation are not changing at all. I'm not, I'm not quite sure where that confusion came from, but uh, here to clarify that the hours of operation are remaining the same. Uh, this license, this liquor license was approved several years ago uh, to have outdoor hours go until 2 a.m. during the week and 4 a.m. Uh, on the weekend, so that is not changing. Uh, the indoor hours remain the same as well. Um, like I said, this application is simply just to add some indoor space. Dhruv is, is taking over the neighboring unit. Um, we're, of course, happy to answer any questions. The reason we're here before you tonight is uh, because of the uh, capacity of the space. It's a large venue. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions. If, if, if you want us to save the SLA related questions to the committee meeting on the 28th, we're happy to do that. Um, and if there are operational questions, we're of course happy to answer them. Any questions on this item? Are there any questions on this item? I see no hands. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Have a good evening. Question. I, I have a question. I can't find my little hand here. I have a question. What is the capacity again? If you can give us the, the capacity of the space. Um, yeah, hold on just a minute so I can pull it up. It's a, it's a, it's a large, uh, it's a very large venue. Uh, the capacity is 1600. Repeat that, I didn't hear it. Uh, 1600, 1632 to be exact. And you're saying that the weekend hours are until 4 p.m.? Uh, 4 a.m., but. 4 a.m. Okay. Nothing is nothing is changing here. This this place has been uh, in operation for many years. We're the only the only change here that's happening is the indoor portion of the premises. Um, we're basically knocking down a wall from the neighboring unit and just expanding ever so slightly, but nothing is changing in the actual method of operation. Madam Chair, I have a question, Arthur Davanovsky. 
I have a question because when we spoke with you folks on the SLA, I, I know there was like some change to the outdoor space. Can you explain to us what are the hours of the operation for the outdoor right now? With the yeah, absolutely, houses? Arthur. Um, yes. The hours of operation for the outdoor space uh, that was approved years past and will continue to be the hours of operation are 2 a.m. Sunday to Wednesday and 4 a.m. Thursday to Saturday. That's the closing hour. For the outdoor space? For the outdoor space. I know that uh, is not the standard hours for uh, outdoor space in this community board. I know you have stipulations that ask for earlier, uh, but this was approved many years ago uh, and has been operating with those hours for a long time. Madam Chair, the hand raise is not working, and I was raising my hand. It uh, is, Julia. Sorry. It's working. Let's click I on. I can't get it to go up. Are you finished, Arthur? Yes, yes. I mean, to me, it's a, they, they changed the license, and we, we don't give the, the hours to 4 a.m. anymore. That's why that's my main concern with that. And actually, they're applying for a new license because they're changing the, the size of the location. We, we don't really give 4 a.m. anymore to anyone. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that you have 4 a.m., but. Like I said, we can we can take this up at the committee meeting if you would like, but. Um, sure. This is not an app. This won't be a new application. The, the SLA has their own processes uh, uh, for right, when right. a licensee expands their footprint. I understand. I just the 4 a.m. outdoor. It just doesn't sound right to the to the SLA right. committee, to be honest with you. I may say something, Madam Chair. Bogdan Bakharovsky. Okay, Bog. Yes, okay. Our stipulation on our approval, yes or no, for any weekend license is that outdoor space is closing at 11 during the week and on weekends at 1 a.m. If that is different case, I don't know if we can take any, any voting, any steps, because actually, is against our stipulation they that said we I want to say. for years, for years. Even if somebody wants to like the hotel on White Avenue, wants to have the open space, outside open space for up to, let's say, 2 or 3 a.m., we say no, and they went directly to SLA because that is going to against our own stipulation. That's I what understand that, Bogdan, but this establishment was already approved by by this by the SLA committee to have the hours. We're not changing the hours. This is not a new license application. That's correct. Maybe that's correct. But so that's mean if the SLA approve, we have nothing to say. Because okay. it's against our rules. That's what I try to say. Right. This is just just all we all we are seeking approval for at the committee meeting uh in a couple of weeks is the expansion into the next door unit. It has nothing to do with the operation or the hours or anything, the outdoor space, anything along those lines. Madam Chair, I have my hand raised for a few Sorry, Madam Chair, Iris, Julia, is still, Iris, Julia is still waiting. Julia is still waiting, Madam Chair. Yeah, Iris had hand had up. Hand up. So I have a question. So what would be, thank you, Madam Chair. What would be the capacity now that you are spending? Uh, or, or... We're adding, we're adding 100, a 100 person capacity. I so believe you... it, it was 1500 before and now it's 1600. Okay. And you are planning to have 1600 people in the bar yard until four. No, years. no, no. That the 1600 is the max capacity as, as, uh, given by the Department of Buildings. That's a, that's that's just a number that, that the DOB gives in a certificate of occupancy. So I've been member of the community board for almost seven years and I never heard anyone who have that, that, that permit for 4 a.m. So I don't know if maybe when you guys renew the license, we can do something because that is crazy. I mean, I, I we don't want to have any business uh, with people outside, especially that number of people. Uh, this is in a, a this is in a non residential area. There aren't there aren't many people living nearby and and quite frankly, um, the SLA will approve 
an application for an alteration, they won't make us amend our method of operation, our hours, or anything along those lines. All right. Thing having changed in this community, uh, probably when they had pulled that, probably it was a, not a lot of people living around there. So maybe we have to send a letter to them because I don't think this is fair for the people who live around the business, and I don't think we should allow that. Thank is you. there anyone here that lives around there? It doesn't matter. We are here to represent the community. It doesn't matter if any any other member live around that that, that, that location. We are. Member I understand. My, my point is represent. really just that there, there aren't. Let her finish. Let okay. her finish. Still. Apologize. So we are here to represent all Williamsburg, uh, South Side, uh, North Side. So it doesn't matter if we live around there. We need to make sure that we do the right thing for the people who live around that business. Thank you. Understood. Julia Foster. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was asked the questions that I wanted to ask. I wanted to know how many more people it would add to it. Thank you, Iris. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. You're welcome, my love. Kelly, you had your hand up. My answer is up, Madam Chair. Sante. Uh, yeah, I'd love to, you know, you, you state uh, that you know, there is no change, but, you know, the change is like uh, from 2 to 4 a.m. That's what, uh, uh, what that's what he says in the agenda. No, that's why I tried to clarify. The agenda was incorrect. I'm not sure how it became that way. The hours have always been 4 a.m. on the weekends, and it will remain that way. Outdoor. Yes. But certainly, you know, I not approved by this community board you know that's was an yes, approval. approved by this full board in fact brought in front of this full board and then approved by the the sla committee if i may if i may madam chair bogdan i never remember that we approve outdoor space other than our situation if somebody did not sign our situation we say just basically no and we did to nobody, to nobody to change our situation letter. So I do not believe that this committee board one ever agree for outdoor space out until 4 a.m. Maybe SLA gave the applicant okay to that, but we never did in my experience and my understanding never to any applicant we never approve outdoor space other than our, our stipulation which is maximum on the weekends until 1 a.m thank you okay Katie, did you have your hand up for a question on this side simon, simon uh i did um but simon can go first if he wants Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, could could we, as a body, can we bring this up as a vote uh, if if uh, to change the hours, uh, you know, as a board? Because I, what what uh, Bogdan is saying is 100% right. I I never know of a of a of a uh, of establishment that was given to 4 a.m. I've been following the SLA for many years and never ever given these hours. Could we, as a board, vote tonight to uh, reduce the hours? I think it would be best to go to the committee and have a discussion and come back with a recommendation. That, that's not how the SLA well, operates. I'll just add that. Can I can I can I put a vote on the table tonight? Uh, what, tonight? What year, what right year now? was this voted on, Phil? 2019. Really? Um, if yeah. if you don't mind, can I allow um, the oper the owner and operator Drew to to? Uh, well, wait one second. Let me finish talking, uh, sure. Chair. Can I put a can I put a vote on the table to vote now? To remove those hours to back to 1 a.m. Like Bogdan said We're before. We're not in the board meeting. Uh, this is the public hearing time. Okay, Bogdan, can you bring it up later for the for the full board? So basically, uh, to answer the question, basically our committee, SLA committee, is going to review the application. Actually, when the gentleman and with his uh, client came to our committee, we uh, re request that the full application is going to be presented to the full board because of the capacity, which is over 1600. Okay, that is one problem. Another problem, which which is okay. 
Another problem, again, we as a committee, we never did that. Like I said before, and never gave okay to anyone for outdoor space other than our stipulation. So I don't know how we're going to do that. So either we can say no or change our stipulation. In this case, if we're going to change our stipulation for this applicant, we have to follow for others and others and take the different uh, steps for the whole community board because that is, that is one time application for just this applicant, 599 Johnson Street, or anybody is going to come to us and say, no, oh, you gave to them, you have to give to others. So what, what to answer your question is, we're going to review the application, and basically, if it's not going to be okay with our stipulation, we're going to say no. That's in what I believe. Understood. Yes. I just want to go. Yeah, I just want to say well, because... Bogdan, he's, Bogdan, he's claiming that he, he got the hours. So we as a board, we as a, as a committee, we should bring it up by ourselves and, 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 um, I am, and send a letter to SLA. I am, I am Simon, saying, Simon, let me, Bogdan, I let me say, not let recall. Simon, go to the committee. Uh, committee should take a look back. Right. Simon, I'm going to tell you, we're going to meet this. And then... I was going to state that we may need to go back to 2019 and find out what we voted on and how we came yes. along this part of giving someone 4 a.m. Since I've been on this committee, I have not heard that. And you have, a, you have the stipulation. And we need to look at it. also their certificate of occupancy if it had expired during that time and they're still trying to push for a 4 a.m. Once again, once I say, let that clarify. Once again, if any application, any applicant did not sign, did not agree to our stipulation, which means has to sign our stipulation, we say no, or the applicant applicant withdraw his application and went directly to SLA, like the hotel White Avenue Hotel, or any other. So what I try to bring to attention to everybody, I am not saying that we not say okay, but I do not recall and we did not say okay to any applicants for outdoor space for that hours. Thank you. So to add something back then. Go, uh, uh, I can go now, uh, Madam Chair. I think I was going to go after Simon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Better go now. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to, to chime in. I, I mean, I, do, I don't live around the venue, uh, but I know the area well. It's heavily industrial. Uh, there aren't many people who are living around uh, that venue or the numerous other venues that are around there, um, which is a very sort of strong um, uh, central location for a pretty robust nightlife community in New York City. Um, and so a number of those venues do operate at similar hours, uh, some of which um, did go through this community board, some many of which opened in the last five years um, and were approved for similar hours. And so, um, you know, I do think it's important to go back to the record. Um, I brought this up the, at the last SLA committee meeting that, um, you know, there are pockets of our neighborhood, especially in deep industrial areas um, that um, do have, you know, venues um, that are producing um, pretty world renowned events, um, drawing large, large audiences and serving a culture that, you know, do stay up later than I think a lot of us do, um, but uh, it is serving a particular audience and community um, in our area. So just wanted to, uh, to point that out. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Uh, Robert Jeffries. Uh, yeah, I live in the area and I have frequented elsewhere plenty of times and I really enjoy the area and the environment and culture. And, um, if I really think we do have to go back to whatever the vote was in 2019 and see what that was, but I don't think that that was, that should have kind of been brought up at all today. It doesn't sound like that was what was on the table originally. Um, but here we are and I will not be voting to change those hours if that's the, if it comes down to a vote. And I just wanted to show some support for um for the presentation. So thanks. Okay. Yeah, so 
Um, thank you. Uh, I actually had similar things to say uh, to what Katie said. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are other venues uh, really close by to there. Um, and I think that whatever, you know, whatever had been voted on needs to be reviewed. Um, and, uh, you know, considering last month's meeting where we listened to a hotel that, you know, didn't care about their neighbors, I think it, it has a lot to do if you're going to consider taking something away from someone to find out if there's a reason for doing that. Um, so just kind of echoing what was just said. Thank you. Bruno Daniels. Hey, well, thank you. This is Bruno Daniel um, from Brooklyn uh, Borough Hall. I just, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, address the the comment by Mr. Um, Mr. Dorn or Phil. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, the response to 4 a.m. outdoor operations being something that gives this community board pause. Being does anyone nearby? I just want to. I just want to caution that. Uh, that is that is not a response I think that the borough president would find acceptable, mostly because as has been pointed out, um, I guess in the um in favor, um elsewhere is deep in the industrial business zone. And that is not that is not the ideal use of that space, I would say, according to the Brooklyn Borough President. Um so in addition to you know all the externalities of having a lot of people going in and out of that space. It's not super available to transit. Um, there's all sorts of, you know, things that need to be mitigated that aren't exactly mitigated on top of the fact that it is a priority to retain and preserve industrial businesses and maintain the manufacturing space. Um, yeah, I just want to caution that saying, does anyone live nearby as a response to that? It's not sufficient and it wouldn't be satisfactory. There are other things that go alongside that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Er Eric, was Eric. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm neutral. Uh, I know that elsewhere, I don't think we have any complaints from them. They've been a pretty good neighbor. I am surprised to hear 4 a.m. outdoor, but until we look at the document from 2019, um, which we will do in committee, I think, you know, uh, we should take it up then and then and then bring it back. I'm, I am a little surprised at the 4 a.m. because I was on the SLA committee then, and I know when Tom was chair, <clears throat> I have a hard <laughs> time believing that he would have gone for it. But um, I'm not remembering that meeting from three and a half years ago. But um, that's it. I just, you know, Tom actually supported this application. Wow. Okay. Well, that's there nice. you go. But uh, we need to look at the document and go yep. over it in the committee, and then, um, you know, but it should be said that elsewhere has been a good neighbor. Other uh, otherwise, and I don't believe we have any complaints on them, but uh, we do need to review that document. Thank you. Aaron. So I just want to echo some of the things that have already been said. Um, you know, I think we should be looking forward. Um, this is a space that has operated um, in the time that I've been on the community board. Complaints have not come. Um, I have been to this location. I think they are a good neighbor, a good operator. Um, and I think there's something to be said about um, the fact that I think a lot of the other <clears throat> um, sort of venues in the area um, are in CB5, uh, do have similar operating hours. And I think rather than uh, trying to punish them for, you know, complaints that aren't there, or, you know, bad practices, we should be looking about how to support them as a venue that is uh, hospitable in the nightlife community to and creates a very safe space for uh, people of color, for queer people, um, and just want to lift that up in the conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I see no more hands. Um, right. I just want to add one last bit before I turn it over to Drew, who I know wanted to say something. Um, I just, oh, yes. I, I would just love to add that um, Drew is a really active member of this community. Uh, he undergoes many philanthropic endeavors here. He's he's been a longstanding neighbor here, and he really takes pride in his um, in his activity in this community. So um, I'll let Drew take it away from here. Excuse me, Madam Chair. I have my hands up. I wanted to ask: um, Do you recall what I was looking through the minutes as a recording secretary? Do you remember the month that you guys agreed to um, got the stipulation from Mr. Tom? I don't have that off off 
the top of my head. Okay, because I have all my minutes, but I'm looking through it, but I appreciate you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I had another question I want to ask the applicant before. Uh, one question, Senator. Sure. Uh, you said you were going to expand uh, uh, into another space. Uh, can I ask how big is the space? Was that the adjoining building? I know you came to the committee, but I couldn't remember exactly. I don't have the square footage uh, with me. Um, Proof might have it, but I know it, it's for a capacity of 100 people. I see. So, and it's a different building and it's been joined or it's part of it's, the same Yeah, building? it's the unit next door. Drew, Drew has been looking to answer that question. Um, so, Drew, feel free to unmute yourself and, and answer. Oh, and, and this is, Madam Chair, uh, this is one of the points I'm glad the Office of the Borough President made that clear that unfortunately this dynamic and the hours can facilitate. And yes, this is an industrial space. I believe I know there are artists. They are uh, living still in industrial space. So it may not be the entire block residential, but maybe dispersed people that reside around there and still they have a life and they still, they may need certain uh, parameter in quality of life, but the loss of industrial spaces, this is happening in Greenpoint, it's happening on Banker Street right now, it is happening, you know, everywhere. And I believe uh, they're just telling us that they expand into the next residential space, uh, residential industrial spaces. So uh, yes, we have this venue, but uh, it's a big trend. Uh, they are eroding uh, our industrial space, you know, and that's what they should be used for. And I believe uh, uh, the hours can only encourage uh, uh, to this to continue to happen. But thank you. Okay. Um, everybody that spoke, please remove your hands or lower your hands. Okay, uh, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Can you turn your volume yes, up a little bit, Drew? You're, you're a little low. Hi, can you hear me now? Your microphone might not be close to your mouth. How's this? Is this okay? Hello? Yeah, that's a little better. Um, sorry. No. No. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, thank you, everybody who spoke. I mean, um, a lot of points were brought up on all sides, and I don't disagree with any. I just want to clarify what's, you know, uh, our experience and what's been going on for the past five years. I mean, we've been in the neighborhood promoting live music. We're a POC-owned venue. We have, like somebody said, you know, we support uh, emerging music, emerging culture, a lot of queer culture. Uh, we are a company of over 120 people. We uh, employed local folks. And yes, I'm on the steering committee of a bar. Um, I'm on the North. I'm on the board of the North Brooklyn Chamber um, Hospitality Alliance. You know, I'm an active member of the community, and I've, we've been here for over ten years. And the reason why um, we were approved for the 4 a.m. back in 2019, with the backing of Tom Burroughs, and uh, we were approved by the full board, is because of all these factors. Is because we were in. Uh, we are an industrial area, and we have no complaints. Uh, we've been open since 2017, and the new space. Just to clarify, we're not going into a separate building or another building. Um, we're uh, there was a restaurant within our building that we don't own. The landlord owns it, that unfortunately went out of business, and we are taking it over to create a private event space. And so yes, we're about a 1600 person venue that's already been. Uh, permitted and approved, and we're adding another 100 people. Um, you know, we've been in the neighborhood. We support all sorts of community events. Uh, we work with uh, the police department uh, very closely. Uh, we work to support safety in nightlife and promote safety uh, across hospitality. You know, um, I just want to clarify what we're doing and who we are. And, uh, you know, we have the backing of even folks like Evergreen, you know, if you look at our letter, letters of support, you know, we're not taking anything away from industrial. We've already been approved by this board. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, address any concerns and questions and continue to work to improve the neighborhood, which is what we've been doing. Um, you know, uh, I, I just want to say, you know, that's what's happening here isn't something um, where we're taking over new spaces or, 
asking for a change in any way to what's already been approved. We're just taking over a restaurant space that went out of business within our building. Uh, it's uh, attached to our space and, um, and that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Drew. Okay, uh, I think we've had all the questions. Uh, there's no hands up. Thank you so much for your presentation. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. You're welcome. Next item on the agenda is a 110, 110 Kent Avenue. That is me as well. That's you too. Okay, you, go ahead. Yep, absolutely. Um, before I begin, I want to make sure my team is is with me here. Um, I should have oh, one of them actually, Avi, uh, for some reason, he was unable to connect as a panelist. His email address was not uh, registering, even though we, we sent in the list. So I would love if we could have him switched from a viewer to a panelist. that is possible. And then I should also have Dirk McCow with me. I'm here. Can you get started on your presentation, please? All right, can I, is, is Avi being promoted to a panelist? He is a panelist. Oh, wonderful. All right. Okay, so like I said, my name is Phil Dorn, uh, attorney for Pizetsky and Bookman. Uh, with me is Avi uh, de Pariguer. Uh, I probably butchered your last name, Avi. I apologize. Uh, Ari is the owner of Av Marceau uh, and Dirk McCall de Paloma, uh, who has been in charge of the community outreach for this project. While I do want to turn it over to Dirk to talk about the great work the team has done thus far, I quickly want to just introduce what this business is all about. Um, Avi is looking to open up a restaurant at 110 Kent Avenue, which is Kent and North 8th. Uh, the space will have three floors, which includes the ground floor, the second floor, and the cellar, uh, the, the basement. Uh, the ground floor will have a restaurant, and which will have an additional bar downstairs. Uh, and then the second floor will be used as a private event space to host small gatherings like corporate events, baby showers, private dinners, etc. Uh, it's not a massive space. Uh, Avi does have plans for, for full transparency. Avi does have plans uh, down the road in a year or two to turn the upstairs portion of the building into a boutique hotel. Uh, and and uh, Dirk has had many conversations with the neighbors about that plan. Uh, however, that plan is is not in the works yet and is not why we're here tonight. Um, none of the logistics are, are, are at the forefront right now uh, as it stands. Um, we uh, are just proceeding with the restaurant and, the, and the, the bar downstairs and the private event space on the second floor. Uh, once Avi decides to move forward with that portion of the plan, he knows that, of course, he cannot proceed until he comes back to this community board for its approval. Um, so for now, we just want to introduce you to the team, tell you about the exciting French Mediterranean restaurant coming to the neighborhood, and tell you a little bit about the outreach we've done. Um, the last thing I'll mention before I turn it over to Dirk is that uh, we're already working on a comprehensive traffic study and a sound study, both of which we will be abiding by. Um, Avi has already partnered with two local parking garages nearby in an attempt to avoid any potential congestion out front. Um, and with all that said, I'll hand it off to Dirk. Thanks so much, Phil. Uh, Avenue Marceau is engaged in an extensive community relations outreach, and we're going to continue to do so. Uh, so far, we've held two community meetings at the site at 110 Kent Avenue. Uh, we've invited neighbors in to see the space and, and to ask questions. We're going to be holding two more community meetings, uh, one on Saturday, February 18th, and one on Sunday, February 26th, both before the committee meeting. Uh, they're both going to be in the afternoon. Uh, we'll have a flyer up and around next week, and I'll share it with the community board office. Uh, we, pur we purchased the voter files uh, for the local blocks and have been sending emails to uh, local residents, uh, making sure that we're in communication with them uh, and they know what we're doing. Um, we've posted around the area a few times. Uh, we've, we're going to be having two or three people uh, sitting nearby uh, some of the major buildings, uh, telling people about the project and getting people to sign signatures. Uh, so the signatures will be gathered this month, so they'll be very fresh. Um, we've been posting invitations for the community meetings and Facebook groups, uh, and we've started meeting with local groups, and we're open to uh, meeting with 
with new ones. Uh, people have people to suggest um, we're going to be meeting with all the local elected officials in the area in the next few weeks. And um, I've been going to the last few SLA committee meetings, uh, so we know uh, what's been affecting other applicants and we're trying to make sure we're doing this all right. And that's it. If anybody from the community board would like to see the space, uh, please just reach out to me. Uh, the community board has my email. That wraps up our presentation. If anyone has any questions, thank you. Are there I, any questions? I have. Yes, yeah. it's Mary. It's Mary. I have a question. Okay. Um, my que first of all, hi Dirk. It's Mary O'Damarak. Um, I am very excited to hear about this new French restaurant coming to our neighborhood. My only question is, since you mentioned that there is going to be a boutique hotel uh, in the future. What happens to the restaurant then? The restaurant will remain. It will remain. So the space for the hotel will be where? On the third floor only? That's right, the third floor and uh, potential use of the roof space. But um, like we said, that is not in, in this part of the application right now. Okay, that is a very small space. So I'm not understanding how many how many rooms for a hotel would you be able to carve out of that space? Um, perhaps Avi knows that answer off the top of his head, but uh, like I said, we're not we're not here for the hotel. We don't have any of the logistics worked out right now. Hence, hence why we're not applying for a hotel right now. I just wanted to be fully transparent that um, that it is in the plans. Actually, while I'm looking at my notes right now, I see 16 rooms. So. Um, that's the answer. 16 rooms on the 3rd floor. Yep. I have to revisit that because I don't recall 16 rooms on the 3rd floor. Okay, maybe in the entire building, but not on the 3rd floor. It's a very small building. Avi, you're, you're muted. It looks like you're trying to speak up. Yeah, sorry, I introduced myself. Hi, Mary. Nice to meet you. Hi. So. Again, it's true. Phil, Phil said true. We, we we're not here to talk about like the application for the for the hotel, but eventually, the second floor and the top floor will be the bedroom, if we get approved. If everything is on the approved. right. So yes, the, the the second floor space, which I mentioned, is going to be a private event space that will be converted into uh, hotel rooms as well. So it'll be the second and third floors. Okay. So your plan to convert the um, the space would be when next year, two years, three um, years? At a minimum, one year. One year. So the second you're going to expend a lot of time, energy, and money for the second floor, and then reconvert it to a hotel space. That's right. We we want to make use of the space um, while we have it now. Um, and like we said, it'll just be for private events. So those are not every night. It's just kind of overflow space that if we have it, we might as well use it. If someone wants to have a little birthday party or a baby shower or something like that, uh, until the, the, the plans for the hotel come to fruition. And then at that, at that point, then we will, uh, halt the, uh, the operation of the private event space and, and begin the process of converting it. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Steve Chesler. Thank you. Uh, do you uh, have an arrangement with state parks to use the patio that's part of Marsh Beach? Yes, we, uh, and Dirk, Dirk can speak to that, I believe, but we have been in contact with the park um, to make sure all the outdoor space is, is, um, is um, compliant. And do you have hours? Um, Carved out for that, and also, is there like a financial, like a fee arrangement? I'm not sure your your question or the hours. You're asking for the hours of operation on the outdoor on the outdoor space. Oh yeah, uh, it'll be uh, whatever the um, 
the committees. Yeah, we, we, we just done that. We just had to talk with uh, the New York State Park. Um, we right now sharing the with the architect the plan of the patio, what is possible, what is not, and uh, we didn't talk about the hours. But you know, it's gonna be a restaurant, so we're not gonna push crazy uh, about the hour, operating hours. It's gonna be closed like a, a, a the hours restaurant. will be what what this committee is stipulated. <laughs> As opposed to elsewhere, just a few moments ago, the hours will abide by the committee's stipulation stipulated hours. Yeah, the park closes at nine, I believe. So, right, but th th this will be adjacent to the park. It won't be in the park. Yeah. Well, the patio is part of the park, right? Um, yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any Thank you. other questions? I see no other hands. Thanks so much for your presentation. Have a Thank good you very much. Have a wonderful Bye evening, welcome. everyone. Thank you for your question. Next item is uh, liquor license. Are there any speakers on liquor license? No, there's no speakers on liquor licenses. Thank you so much. That concludes our public hearing session. Now we'll go into our board meeting. Can we have a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Can I have roll call vote? Uh, uh, roll call, please. Yes. Gina Argento. Gina Argento. Baden Bakowski. Here. Lisa Bermonti. Lisa Bermonti. Gina Barrows. Here. Eric Buzaitis. Here. Iris Cabrera. Here. Phil Capanegro. Here. Frank Cabone. Here. Steve Chesler. Yeah. Michael Chiancelli. Teresa Sincaro. Stephanie Cuevas. Ron and Daly. Giovanni D'Amato. Here. Evan Drinkwater. Here. Uh, Sonia Gina Argento couldn't be heard again. Okay, thank you. Otto Dibonaski. Here. Lloyd Fing. Julia Amanda Foster. I'm here. Madam Chairperson Fuller. Here. Crystal Garcia. Here. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. Katie, your name is Pam. Did you oh, hear me? I'm sorry. Can you um, hear me? I'm Katie, here. Danny uh, Horwich. Uh, I'm here. I just you. I couldn't hear you for about thirty seconds. Okay. Yeah, you dropped out, Sonia. Yeah, Sonia. Sonia. I'm here. Sonia, Sonia, can, Sonia, can you hear me? I'm on. Yeah, I'm not here. I'm not your name yet, honey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moses ending. Robert Jeffrey. Oh. Yeah. Bonzina Kaminsky. I'm here. Corey Canton. Here. Paul Kilterborn. Here. William Glasbow. William Glasbow. Here, here. Yolando. Yolando. Marie Liaison. Here. Yo Lo, Trina McKeever. Here. Adam Myers. I'm here. Sante Michelli. Michelli. Sante. Sante. Toby Markowitz. Did you call me, uh, Sonia? I lost you for a moment. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm okay. having some audio issue now. So please. Okay, focus. I'm here. I'm here. Thank okay. you, Sante. Toby Markowitz. Toby? Rabbi David Niederman. Yeah. Karen Nieves. Mary Adamerick. I'm here. Dan Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sokwa. Yeah. Isaac Sokwa? Yeah. 
Go T. Here. William Vega. Here. Maria Viera. Present. You, Simon Weiser. Simon Weiser. Well, well, you hear me? You hear me? Sonia, uh, Sonia uh, yes. Lisa, Lisa Bermont is having trouble with her mic, and she's going in and out. So Thank you. Right, she just text me. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate it. Simon, I heard. David Harlick is here. Yes, Mr. David. Thank you. Madam Chair, 30, 33 members answer the call. Answer the call. How many? Three, three, 33. Thank you. Can I have approval of the agenda, please? Motion, Del Teague. Second, Julia. Del Teague. Del Teague and, and uh, Julia Foster, all in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstentions. Motion carried. Can I have approval of the minutes, please? Motion to approve. David Niederman. Vega seconds. Rabbi Niederman and William Vega, all in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstentions. Motion carried. Okay, uh, public session. Can we have the speakers, please? Because that, Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Constantia Malashinska, and I am here with an announcement about the City DOT's uh, BQE corridor project. So I am working with North Brooklyn Parks Alliance to deliver community outreach in the coming weeks. Uh, the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance is an official community partner along C Nix and Evergreen and transportation alternatives in our neighborhood, specifically with a mandate to organize visioning workshops for the DOT. And ours are coming next Wednesday, February 5th, uh, 15th, yes, sorry, and March um, 4th, which is a Saturday, and more on that in a second. But just to explain that the Adams administration and the city DOT are planning to address um, longstanding BQE issues such as safety, noise and air pollution, and reconnecting neighborhoods that were sliced by the BQE uh, decades ago. And this is an excellent opportunity to weigh in and kind of give shape to the future of the BQE. And the next opportunity will only come up in the fall, and that will be feedback on the proposed idea. So this is the time to get creative. And the workshops will look to collect ideas and comments on the planned modernization of the north stretch of the BQE. So that's anything from the Brooklyn Navy Yard up to the Kostushko Bridge. So the best way to sign up and get more information about the workshops and everything related to the BQE corridor project is to go on the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance website, which is nbkparks.org and sign up for the newsletter there. I only have a moment to explain. So best way, go on the website nbkparks.org and sign up for the newsletter. So you can register for these coming sessions. That's February 15th and then March 4th. March 4th is in person, it will be family friendly. It'll be at the Bushwick in the Park community um, room at, at the park and it will be a drop-in. So it'll be several hours to come in. And the first session is virtual on an evening where hopefully a lot of folks can participate and uh, please join us and uh, give us our ideas for the BQE um, North Corridor. Thank you so much. Next up speaker is Lauren Comito. Hi. Good afternoon, evening. It's evening now. Um, so I'm Lauren Camito. I'm the branch manager at the Leonard Library, um, which, as you may know, we closed last month for a two year um, HVAC renovation and ceiling restoration. Um, now that we're finished packing up 
every single book in the library. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, William for, Vega, for helping. Um, we're coming out into the community with the bookmobile and our little book wagon to try to bring Leonard out into the neighborhood. Um, so starting with, we're going to have our bookmobile service out in front of the Leonard Library on alternate Thursdays in February and Wednesdays beginning in March. So the next uh, bookmobile service at the Leonard Library site on DeVoe Street will be um, next Thursday the 16th. And then after that, it will be Wednesday, March 1st and Wednesdays alternating going forward. Um, and you can also find us every Tuesday at Talea, the brewery at, at 87 Richardson Street and Leonard, uh, where we'll have our book wagon, uh, books for checkout, staff to help with reference queries and um, book reserves and other things of that nature. Um, in the future, we're going to be doing more outdoor programming, but it's a bit cold for that right now. Uh, so as soon as it gets nice, we'll be taking story time out into the parks um, and being in the community where we want to be. Um, just we don't have a building at the moment. So I hope to see everybody at either the Bookmobile or Talea on Tuesdays. Um, and thank you. That is it for up speakers. Thank you. Councilman Russell, I see your hand is up. Would you like to speak now? That would be great. Thank you so much, Chair Fuller. It's good You're to welcome. be with you and all of the distinguished members of Community Board One. Just wanted to share a few quick updates from our office and, you know, most of all, just underscore anything we can do to help all around our district. Please reach out and let us know. Uh, we are very, very, very much eager to help. Um, so a few upcoming events, we're doing a quarterly forum on the New Heart site with DEC and North Brooklyn neighbors and Assemblymember Gallagher and Senator Gonzalez, our new state senator, Chris Gonzalez. That's coming up on the 16th, so next uh, next week uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we'll, we can uh, put a link in the, in the chat, I guess, for um, getting in on that. It's on Zoom. But uh, the cleanup of New Heart is progressing, but you have a chance to hear from DEC and the developer there with any questions that you may have. The following week on the 23rd, we've got a, a, a forum with the Army Corps, and I really want to thank CB1 and Steve for your all's leadership on this issue about the 15-foot you know, wall that is being considered for uh, uh, our waterfront. Uh, Congressman Velasquez has graciously agreed to kind of serve as the host of this town hall and lend her gravitas in helping us hold the Army Corps accountable and get all the information. So this forum is going to be on February 23rd at 7 p.m. at Triskelion Arts. Uh, there will also be a hybrid component if you'd like to join via Zoom. This is a great opportunity for you to engage directly again with the Army Corps in advance of the March 7th deadline to submit your comments uh, for their plan uh, for a seawall along our waterfront. Rabbi Niederman convened a really uh, helpful uh, and, and thoughtful uh, community board committee hearing earlier this uh, past month uh, on the situation at Bedford Gardens and along with Congresswoman Velasquez and Borough President Reynoso and Assemblymember Gallagher and Senator Salazar and Controller Lander uh, and of course the tenants at Bedford Gardens including Rabbi Niederman uh, we have been organizing to push back against the egregious and unconscionable rent increase that Krauss is proposing that would amount to an 80% rent increase over three years for many tenants, seeing their rent go from $1,000 a month to $1,800 a month in just three years. Uh, we cannot let this happen. We will not let this happen. Uh, our office has been knocking on every door in Bedford Gardens. We've organized tenants meetings. We set up uh, 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 a, a space for tenants who aren't tech savvy to come and uh, testify uh, at the public hearing that was held online. We're meeting, uh, the elected officials are meeting with HBD later this month uh, to express our serious concerns and to, to prevent these rent increases from taking effect. And Congresswoman Velasquez and her team have been doing a great job of engaging HUD as well, who will have to sign off on this. So we'll be meeting with them as well, thanks to her. It was, a, I think, a productive community forum last week on the open street proposals 
for Berry Street and the Bankers Anchor proposal. I want to thank everybody who came out and gave thoughtful feedback. Um, DOT is compiling that feedback now, and we're expecting them to move forward on uh, more permanent designs this summer for Berry Street and Bankers Anchor, which we're excited about. We also heard from DOT uh, this past month about their proposals for expanding City Bike in Greenpoint and the north side. I think they've got 27 locations for expanding density of docks, new dock locations. I hope that CB1 will, will provide an opportunity for uh, community members to engage on this issue, um, but especially in Eastern Greenpoint and Northern Greenpoint that are really 10 to 15 minutes away from the G train, having more city bike docks is really important uh, for people to have uh, more convenient access to getting around. So we were pleased by the initial proposals we heard from DOT. We also um, have been working with DOT to try and calm traffic and improve safety around Commercial Street um, in Northern Greenpoint. Some neighbors are hosting a meeting on the 21st at Greenpoint Beer and Ale uh, to get input on how we can make Commercial Street safer. We pushed DOT to get a four-way stop installed over at Clay and Commercial and Franklin at that intersection. And we've begun looking at, at trying to reduce traffic on DuPont and Commercial between Franklin and uh, West to one way in each direction. And we're eager to engage the Transportation Committee of CB1 on those issues as well to try and improve safety over there. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to, to flag the Meeker Avenue plumes. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do two more things. The Meeker Avenue plumes, We there was a, a really helpful community forum with the EPA on our newest federal Superfund site uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Greenpoint Library. Uh, we got the EPA back out to, uh, to PS 110, where there's been a lot of concerns about whether, uh, about the safety for young people in the school with the status of the Meeker plume. Um, they're going to start uh, expeditiously doing some testing there, and we'll, it takes a couple months to gather the results, but we'll share those with the community as soon as we have them. Uh, and we hope to organize with the PS 110 community, another community forum for people to engage on the Meeker Plumes and to get involved in the CAG, which is going to be a new community advisory group. If folks are interested in getting involved in that and providing some rigorous oversight of the EPA to make sure that we get this, this area cleaned up comprehensively, please let me know. We'd love to get you involved. Um, and then lastly, I really appreciated uh, you all bringing in the, the presentation on the Newtown Creek Superfund site. You know, we're really lucky that Congresswoman Velasquez has now been rezoned to uh, redistricted to um, represent the north side and Greenpoint. So she's going to, she and her team and Dan Wiley in particular are going to be involved in uh, the Newtown Creek Superfund. And we've got to get that sped up. Uh, the timeline that the EPA has provided to us is unacceptable. We've already been at it for a decade. We're not waiting another decade plus till we get plans for, for how this is getting cleaned up. It's got to move faster. So with the Congresswoman's help and the Newtown Creek Alliance and Willis's leadership, I'm confident we're going to be able to get that more on track. And you know, just this past Friday in the city council, we held an oversight hearing on CSO citywide. And you know, while the the city DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, highlighted some of the uh, the same things that were mentioned tonight around reductions in CSOs at Newtown Creek, unfortunately, the DEP plans would increase CSOs at Bushwick Inlet Park, at uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, kind of area just north of the Navy Yard Wallabow Channel where we're seeing a lot of new development, where we're finally trying to hopefully get Bushwick and the park built. Um, so there are other communities where we still have a lot of work to do to reduce CSO outflows. And uh, we're gonna continue to push DEP to make the necessary investments uh, for our health and safety and well-being, especially as we're continuing to activate our waterfront sites. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's a pleasure to join you all at CB1. Um, we've been doing our best to try and help with contracting, it, contracting and procurement issues with MOCs. Uh, we'll continue to do that as you all um, uh, go through your process to get some additional staff on board. But if we can be helpful to the board and, of course, the, the community at large in any way, please let me know. Uh, we really are eager to help, and it's it's great to be with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Thank you for all your help. Thank you, Chair Fuller. Our You're welcome. Committee reports, uh, Veteran Affairs. Hey everyone, um, just a quick update. So uh, Veterans Affairs, we met uh, the middle of June. We had our first meeting after a couple of years. 
Uh, we had quorum. Phil and I were there, and uh, we had some people from uh, the community. Just a quick update. We're planning to do some work with um, the parks department to identify some of the memorials and the markers that need some help, and then we'll see if we could get some volunteers uh, to, to work and clean up with the um, parks department. We spoke to uh, Mary Salig. Also, Joanna in the office uh, reached out to the Veterans Affairs Department for the city, and uh, we're working on getting someone to come to the next meeting so that we could get some information out uh, to the different vet groups that are in the community. So um, our next meeting is going to be on WebEx, and I think it's on Monday the, let me see, Monday the 27th. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Parks and Waterfront. Thank you, Madam Chair. Phil Caponegro here. We had our meeting on the 24th of January. Uh, we were one short of a quorum, but we had a good meeting anyway. I have three motions to present, so I'll begin right away. Uh, there was a motion made to rename the basketball courts at Peter Cooper, uh, Peter Cooper, at Cooper Park, uh, in honor of Tareen Spears. He was a neighborhood and local community resident who did a lot of volunteer work with young people. Passed Torian. away. In... Say? Torian. Oh, Torian, I apologize. Torian Spears, I apologize. Uh, he did a lot of, of, of volunteer work with young people in the community. And uh, this is a, you know, we, we thought it was a, a wonderful way to honor him. His name will always be remembered. Uh, we voted, we was an 8-0-0 vote. So we didn't have a quorum, but so it's a recommendation. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like a vote from the full board, please. I'll make the motion, Trina. Thank you, Chancellor. Second. Second. Trina and who? Steve, Steve. 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 Um, roll call vote, please. Hold on, before we do it, it's just a motion to rename the park. It's to rename the basketball court. Basketball court, okay. It's Thank in you. Frost Playground, not Cooper Park, Frost Playground. Where? It's the Frost. Frost, Frost Thank Playground. You. Thank you for the clarity, Trina. You ready, guys? Clarification. Ready for the vote? Gina Argento. Gina Bonin Bakarowski. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes, Sonia. Thank you. Phil Caponegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Tangeli, Teresa Sincaro, Stephanie Cuevas, Juan and Daly, Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Arthur Dibonofsky. Yes. Lloyd Fang. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Dialis Fuller. I mean, sorry. Crystal Garcia. Yes. Joe Goldstein, Joe Gross, David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Danny Horowitz. Yes. Sonny Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Mosina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kilterborn. Yes. William Claswell. Yolanda. Marie Liaison. Yes. Yolo. Trina McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Santi Michelli. Yes. Toby Moskowitz. Rabbi Needleman. Yes. Yeah, there was a yes from Toby. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yes. Miss Toby. I've seen yes, you the throughout yes. the meeting and you're not answering my roll call, Miss Toby. Please be mindful. Tara Nieves. Mary Adamerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. 
Isaac Sofer. Yes. Del okay, thank you. Del T? Yes. William Vega? Yes. Maria Viera? Maria Viera? Yes. Simon Weiser? Simon? Sonia. Somebody call me? Yes. Can I move on? Hold on, because I'm counting it. it oh, okay. Okay. We got 31 years, civil no, civil obsession, civil recusal. People, if we had 33 at the roll call, you guys have to answer the roll call, please. It's 31 years, civil no, civil recusal, and civil, I mean, civil notes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm going to move on to the second item. Uh, it also involves Frost Playground. Um, it, it's been neglected for a long time. So we motion was made to send a letter to Parks and to our local officials in the area to find some capital funds to do renovation on that playground, on Frost Playground. Can I have a motion on that? Do we make Frost, I make the motion. Thank you. Seconds. Foster and Vega. Thank you, William. Uh, Julia and Vega. Yes. Thank you. Ready? Gina Argento. Baden Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bomanti. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosati. Eric? Yes, sorry, yes. Okay. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Phil Capanegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Chinchella. Teresa Sincaro. Stephanie Cuevas. Juan and Daly. Giovanni Del Mato. Yes. Giovanni? Yes. You hear me? Sorry. Thank you. Aaron Drickwater. Arthur Dimanowski. Yes. Lloyd Fang. Julia Amanda Foster. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Thank you. Crystal Garcia. Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Denny Horowitz. Yes. Thank you. So any Gray say yes. Moses ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Rosina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Corey Catton. Yes. Paul Coulterborn. Yes. William Glasball. Yes. Yolando. Marie Liaison. Yes, listen, uh, Sonia, Lisa Bramante says yes also. Okay, thank you. YOLO. YOLO? Excuse me. Yes, Trina McKeever. Yes, no, not her picture. Okay, Mr. Rabbi Newman, please mute yourself. Mount. Mount. Rabbi Newman, please mute yourself. Adam Myers. Yes. Adam Myers. And there's been a strong Adam. Yes, yes again. Yes again. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sante Macelli. Yes. Thank you. Toby Moskowitz. Yes. Thank you. Rabbi David Needleman. Yes. Rabbi ne yes, thank you. <laughs> Kevin Nieves. Mario Domerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sofer. Yes. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Viera. 
Yes. Thank you. Simon Weiser. Simon? Thirty-one yes. Civil no. Civil abstention. Civil recusal. Motion carries. Thank you, thank you, Sonia. And uh, the, my last item, uh, it, it concerns some uh, a piece of play equipment called a wheelchair accessible swing. The parks department provides handicap uh, swing equipment, play equipment in the parks, but this is a specific item. Uh, a wheelchair bound person can wheel this right into th this this uh, thing and you could strap yourself in and it can be used in, in, in a city park. They do exist, but the city does not have any. So we would like a, a, a letter to be sent to the parks. We were asked them to find a working design and to purchase these wheelchair accessible swings to be placed in all our community parks and eventually all New York City parks. If I can have a motion on that. Motion, Trina. Trina. Second, Del David, David Niederman. Trina, Trina and Del T. Roll call vote, please. Dina Argento. Baden Bakarowski. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. Dina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. You, Phil Caponegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Thank you. Michael Cincelli. Teresa Sincara. Stephanie Cueva. Juan and Daly. Giovanni Del Mato. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Thank yes. you. Arthur Dimanowski. Yes. Lloyd Feng, Julia Manda Foster. Yes. Rachel Garcia. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Denny Horwitz. Yes. Sonny Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Bonzina Kaminsky. Yes. Bori Canton. Yes. Paul Kittleborn. Yes. William Glasbow. Yes. Joe Orlando. Marie Lieza. Yes. Oh, sorry. Joe Lowe. Joe Lowe. Tina McKeever. Yes. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Sante Michelli. Yes. Toby Markowitz. Yes. Rabbi David Niederman. Yes. Karen Nieves. Mary Adamerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sofa. Yes. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Simon Weiser. Thirty one, yes, civil no, civil obsession. Civil recusal, motion carries. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you all. That's my report. Thank you. Environmental protection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, we have a few items to work through. With that, the first are two, excuse me, um, 
State Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, aka SPEDIS permit modifications related to dewatering. The first one is for 470 Kent Avenue. It's a uh, project, you know, on the East River waterfront, um, actually closer to it's Wallabout Channel. Um, it was a project that came through environmental for their brownfield cleanup program. Um, it's eventually going to be a mixed mixed use development with a lot of residential apartments. Um, and they're increasing their output uh, a lot from almost 600,000 gallons a day to 2 million gallons a day. But they're continuing to treat the water on site through a settling tank and uh, carbon filters, releasing it through a CSO into Wallabout Channel uh, through an existing CSO. And they're creating a new one uh, that will utilize also, but after construction and if the building is complete, used to um, channel stormwater um, directly into the river versus um, overloading an already overburdened um, sewage system. Um, and then the additional one also related, it's a uh, speed as permit modification for temporary construction dewatering activities at 11 West Street in Greenpoint, which is a large uh, residential development. Uh, four buildings, two are completed. They need to do dewatering related to the development of two more. Um, they were releasing around 576,000 gallons a day. They're going to do 63 gallons a day additionally, and they will be uh, treating that on site as well through settling tanks and filters, and it'll be discharged through an existing manhole into the East River. So I would I need a motion to approve both of these uh, speedest permit modifications for 11 West and 470 Kent. Well, Captain Negro, make the motion. Second, Eric Davis. Bill, who second? Eric. Eric, Bill and, Bill and Eric, roll call vote, please. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the motion to write a motion to approve. Um, to approve two SPDES. Two SPBED. Yeah, S is in Sam. Uh, P is in Paul, D is in David, E is in Edward, S is in Sam. Okay, so or 470 Kent Avenue. 470 Kent Avenue. And 11 West Street. And 11 West Street, right? Yeah, two different per two separate permits, killing two birds. Thank and one you. Permit. Yep. Two separate. Okay. Thank you so much. Ready? Um, Gina Dental. Baron Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bomanti. Yes. Regina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. She has technical difficulties. Oh. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Sorry, that's Bill yes. Cap Eric Rosides. Yes. Sorry, Sonia. Thank you. Bill Caponegro. Yes, Sonia. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Chancelli, Teresa Sincaro, Stephanie Sincere. Cuevas, Juan mm -hmm. Daly, Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. Erin Drinkwater. Yes. To Ari, um, Arthur Dibonowski. Yes. Lloyd Feng, Judy Amanda Foster. Yes. Crystal Garcia. Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein, Joe Gross, David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Danny Horowitz. Yes. Tony Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Mozina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kilterborn. Yes. William Clasbow. Yes. Joe Lando. <clears throat> Marie Lieza. Marie. Marie Lienza, yes. Thank you. Yolo. 
Peter McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Dante Michelli. Yes. Toby Markowitz. Toby. Rabbi David Needleman. Yes. Karen Nieves. Mario Domerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. <clears throat> Bella Sables. Isaac Sofa. Del T. Isaac Sofa, yes. And Del T. Yes. 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 William yes. Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser. You guys are really making me work this one, huh? Dang. Thirty yes, civil no, civil abstention, civil recusal. Motion carries. Great, thank you. I have uh, two more items. The next one is um, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Storm Risk Management uh, Draft Plan. Um, on November 29th of last year, the Army Corps presented their plan um, to. You know, protect our neighborhood from future storm surge. Um, they're predicted to get much worse over the coming uh, years and decades and the rest of the century. Um, and then uh, in January, we had a follow up hearing to get input from board members, committee members, and the general public. And from that, we uh, drafted a plan. Um, you know, they're just very briefly, their plan calls for installing a 400 foot wide storm surge gate across Newtown Creek near uh, where Box Street Park will eventually be. And there'll be what's called tie-in infrastructure from that point, um, sea walls, flood walls, and levees. Some of those walls that correct the council member respectfully, 17 feet tall, um, all along the shoreline, cutting through um, Newtown Barge Park and putting a levee through Transmitter Park and then uh, setting a flood wall up Greenpoint Avenue to West Street. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I submitted this, um, our response as written, it's 15 pages, so I'm not going to read that now. So I'm just gonna, you know, just generally just summarize, um, you know, what, uh, what the response is. We essentially just provided a history of Newtown Creek um, you know, the industrial legacy, the pollution legacy and its current state super run site and the, the situation with CSOs. Um, and then did the same thing for the Greenpoint waterfront, just the history, um, you know, the um, just the rezoning of the neighborhood and how the uh, or, or in progress waterfront parks and the waterfront public access area, Esplanade, that's eventually supposed to connect was a critical um, community a benefit that was negotiated in that rezoning. So it's very important baseline. And just essentially that people you know, embrace the idea that we got to protect the neighborhood from Newtown Creek flooding during future storm surges. Uh, it's the most polluted waterway in the United States. And so we welcome the plan, um, you know, eradicating that flooding um, as, mu as much as possible. Uh, but we had, we had a lot of issues with the design um, the um, the storm the the gate will permanently close off two thirds of the of you know the, the creek. The gate itself will only be 130 feet wide. We're worried about tidal flow being inhibited. Um, that tidal flow helps clean out the the creek, especially during um, rainstorms when the 13 CSOs dump um, incredible amounts of raw sewage into the waterways. Um, worried about what's called an, uh, an induced flooding. Um, that the the gate closed. Well, you know, if there's enormous amount of rain, will cause flooding uh, behind the wall, and uh, worry about that along the uh, the short the, the flood wall along uh, Greenpoint uh, along Greenpoint as well. 
and downstream in the areas that are not protected. And that's a key part of the um, of our response is noting what the areas that won't have uh, any infrastructure, mainly Bushwick Inlet Park and Wallabout Channel. Those areas flooded extensively during Hurricane Sandy and are predicted to be worse. Um, and McCarran Park, um, you know, is a runoff area for that. And the um, area affected by Wallabout Channel, which is has the, the most the biggest CSO in the entire city, five, over 500 million gallons annually, that'll affect Flushing Avenue. It's will affect the southern part of our, part of our district, um, environmental justice areas. So we really point out that th that those areas really need to be addressed as well. Um, but the key thing is is that we, we want a you know a better design. It's really kind of a brute force approach in implementing a wall of this type. And I think you know the a lot of these waterfront spaces have already been designed with uh, elevation uh, built into them. And the parks have already are ele elevated, and so and the idea of erecting a uh, you know a, um, a wall along Greenpoint Avenue where there are businesses and a parking ramp to a large apartment building, and then there's a hill just may, seems to make no sense whatsoever. And the Army Corps was encouraged to us uh, communities to pr provide those those um, those types of details, and and then the main one of the key things going forward also is that a um, a task force or a um, community advisor group, aka a CAG, be formed to work out the details, the planning, and the construction um, over time to really work out those details and, and get them right. Um, so, just you know, the, the document goes into detail in that history and that analysis and that concern. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to committee members, board members, and the public who came and offered their input and their energy. And a special shout out to Willis Elkins, the executive director of Newtown Creek Alliance, who provided some really um, important insight about the creek and CSOs and what to think about. Um, so um, that said, and just this. Can I make a comment when you're done? Uh, yeah, sure. Just I just want to note that this uh, response will go to the Army's Corps of Engineer project managers but, and the um, non federal partners. The Department of Environmental Conservation at the state level and the city's mayor's office, climate and environmental justice. And then it's going to go to all of our elected officials, state senators, congresswomen, uh, state reps, city reps, borough, borough level. Um, and so it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a critical document. It's, you know, I know it's decades away until they actually implement, but we really need to really establish a baseline of uh, the problems and what we, uh, you know, what, what we want differently from it. So. Um, yeah, so if people have any uh, questions. My comment is, is just that board members and community members, everyone should really read the, the amazing document that Steve put together from attending the different meetings and, and really synthesizing the information in a way where he lays out the problem and the problem for us in CB1 and then, um, and does it in a very organized manner and really is hopeful about different ways that the, that it can be approached. I mean, one could think it's a doomsday, horrible scenario. This thought of this, the 17 foot wall across the, the waterfront, but the way Steve broke down the problem and introduced ways to look at it is really, really, really commendable and really something that we should all, we should all read and we should all really thank Steve for. Comment also is thank I, you, Steve. I, I, I know it was no comment, work, but Steve. I read it and thank you, Steve. And I was pissed off that it was 15 pages, but I did <laughs> read it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Julian was 100 pages. He wrote it down. Uh, Steve, I'm gonna, I um, you're gonna request a motion, right? But um, in your report, you're gonna put it as written the motion to send a letter, a response to send a, a response. response to the Army Corps um, in relation to their uh, storm risk management plan. Okay. I'm sorry, but woo. Yeah, no, there's, they, there's, they have much bigger acronyms. And okay. um, I just wanna yeah. make sure I get it right. Thank you, Steve. No, sure. Now, as you guys understand, I'm trying really hard guys, really. <laughs> we appreciate you. You're it's doing great. a great job, Sonia. Don't Thank you, you guys. Thank you, but you're making me work, 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 work. Okay. God yeah, bless but I think a key, a key point that Trina made is that you know, we should look at it as an opportunity. We know we, we we have to deal with this problem. 
you know, with climate and sea level rise and these increasing storm surges. And it's also is just to note is the flooding that happens um, in addition to storm surge, you know, just with just regular crazy rain events, you know, there's flooding. I know we noted that in the document there, you know, the, par the parts of the district is flood during just, you know, a somewhat, you know, major um, rainstorm and then, you know, groundwater, the groundwater um, as sea level rises, so will the groundwater, and that's causing flooding. It's coming into peace, people's basements, um, and um, so th we, you know, that's that's you know, they we really urge them to take that into account, both the you know, the um, to help um, the city and the state, you know, uh, solve those problems as well. Um, yeah. So uh, with that, yeah, if people have comments or questions, uh, call for a motion to approve uh, this response to. The, the Army Corps of Engineers storm risk management plan as written and to be submitted to them and these other other uh, stakeholders. Motion to approve as written. And I second. Vega seconds. Eric and Vega. Roll call vote, please. Give me a minute. I have to write this. Uh, you ready? Gina Ardento. Bonin Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bamansi. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Iris, thank you. Phil Caponegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Chinchelli. Teresa Sincaro, Stephanie Cuevas, Juan and Daly, Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Drinkwater. Yes. Aaron? Yeah, Aaron? Yes. Yes. Arthur Dimonoski. Yes. Lloyd Peng. Yes. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Helmick. Yes. Mike's open. Sabrina Help. Tyson Tush. Katie Danny Rowitz. Yes. Thank you. Someone please introduce yourself. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Rosina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kulterborn. Yes. William Clagsville. Yes. Joe Orlando. Marie Liaza. Yes. Joe Lowe. Trina McKeever. Yes. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Santi Macelli. Yes. Toby Moskowitz. Bye bye, David Niederman. Mr. Rabbi, Rabbi David Niederman. Yes. Thank you. Karen Nieves, Mary Adamaric. Yes. Dennis Peterson, Bella Sables, Isaac Sofer. Del T. Yes. yes, Isaac Sofer, yes. Thank you. William Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser. Thirty years, it will no civil abstention, civil recusal, motion carries. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, some old business item. Um, there's, you know, one other, just one other thing I just quickly add about 210 Greenpoint Avenue, which is a former Speedway service station location at the corner of McGinnis Avenue. Um, the, you know, they came through for the Brownfield cleanup program um, presentation last month. Uh, the, you know, the committee and board members had real issues with the safety of that site with the, um, with the worry of mig migrating contamination off-site 
the uh, construction fence extending all the way to the curb and having Jersey barriers in, in the middle of, of Greenpoint Avenue and um, McGinnis Boulevard create, creating a hazard for pedestrians and for vehicles making a turn. Um, DEC came back to us basically saying that, uh, you know, they re-reviewed re the, the analysis of the investigation and felt like uh, there's no risk for offsite migration of contamination, so they're not going to perform any more testing. Um, DOT is aware of the uh, safety issues related to the sidewalk and the uh, detour pathway in the street with the barriers. Um, and Eric Rosatis, who's on our committee and chair of transportation committee, is is monitoring that. Um, but we, you know, last month we submitted a letter to FDNY requesting, and it's uh, just verifying that the, you know, being that the station house is um, is across the street from the site, and their vehicles will have to make a left turn onto McGinnis, that they can safely clear those barriers. So they acknowledged. They said they um, would be inspect the site and report back. Uh, that was that. And then the final item is a 315 Barry Street is ongoing. It's a you know a BSA permit to allow installation of battery storage system on the roof of a residential building where the zoning doesn't permit it. As remember, FDNY um, presented to the full board during the hearing last month, and we had engaging uh, discussion with them. But one, the one thing, the main key, uh, key, key takeaway is that they acknowledge that they don't have experience extinguishing um, lithium uh, batteries at that scale and definitely not on a on a rooftop. So um, the committee voted unanimously to recommend that the board send a follow up letter to the uh, uh, Board of Standards Appeals to um, take note that FDNY basically acknowledge they don't have experience with a fire dealing with a system like this they're installing and to reiterate our um, uh, our reticence in issuing a special permit on the site. So I need a motion to approve that issuing. I'll make a motion. Uh, second. Second. Mm -hmm. and who? Who? Dale and Vega. So they get the okay, Dal and William Vega, roll call vote, please. Not gentle. Bon and Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. In the barrels. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Phil Caponegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Stephen Chesler. Yes. Michael Chancelli, Teresa Sincaro, Stephanie Cuevas, Ron and Daly, Giovanni Di Amaro. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Yeah. Arthur Divinowski. Yes. Roy Feng. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Chris, Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein, Joe Gross, David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help, Katie Danny Horowitz. Yes. Sonia Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending, Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Monzina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kutterborn. Yes. William Clasball. Mr. Calvo, William, Yolando, Marie Lieza. Yes. Yolo, Trina McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. You, Sante Michelli. Yes. Toby Moskowitz. Bye yes. bye, David Niederman. That was, that was a yes. Thank you. Rabbi David Lederman. This is also a yes. Thank you. Karen Nieves. Maria Domerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. Bella Sables. Isaac Sofer. Isaac Sofer, yes. 
Thank you. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser. One quick question, guys. Am I going too fast? You're perfect. No. Not too fast. Just fine. Thank you. Twenty nine years, civil no, civil abstention, civil recusal. Be careful, guys. We, we're going down from thirty three, went down to twenty nine. Just keep a no. Motion carries. Right, thank you. That that's it for environmental protection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like Sonia said, let's uh, be mindful of the time we're losing people, and we don't want to lose our corn land use. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to be really quick. I don't need a vote. Just uh, to let you know that city planning uh, wanted to let us know that they have a, um, they've, they've gotten some funding to do a couple of studies and the study that affects us and CB3 uh, will be, they can study the uh, explore stormwater flooding, climate change, resiliency in, in the public uh, realm. Then it doesn't involve any kind of construction. They uh, haven't even really laid out the specific geographical area um, but it, 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 they will be studying um, uh, flushing, the flushing uh, Avenue corridor. Um, it appears that there was a, a body of water under there originally, and so there's still a lot of uh, flooding. They also assured us that they are going to be involved in the that the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers stormwall plan, and they seem to um, indicate that they were going to uh, you know, align with us in saying that. The, uh, the, the those huge storm walls that uh, the Army Corps is suggesting um, does not uh, is not in line with our vision for how we want our waterfront to be. And then the other thing, um, just to let you know that um, we had decided to study the, the Bushwick development plan, which was a very comprehensive, great plan. It was not um, accepted by the city. But there was a lot in it really that was in line with the kinds of conditions and policies we've been pushing for. Um, council, uh, council member Gutierrez's office suggested that we compile our conditions uh, and um, put them in a list and also try uh, talking about possibly adding the conditions uh, to our, uh, our, our uh, questionnaires, our rezoning questionnaires. It's time for those questionnaires to be updated anyway, so this is a good time. So we will go, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be compiling that. And some of the uh, council members, uh, committee members, I'm sorry, some of the committee members, trying to go fast here to get, get this done. Some of the committee members are going to have informal discussions with the uh, some of the housing nonprofits just to get a sense uh, unofficially of how they think we're doing with respect to the affordability and the open space and community facilities that we're supposed to have. And then down the road, we're going to meet with the, with the uh, nonprofits and with the elected officials, explore what we've gotten, what we were promised, and strategy for effectively pushing the city and the state to make good on those promises. So that's it. No votes. Done with the uh, report. And thank you very much. Thank you. Transportation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, my my uh, mic went out. So if you can't hear me, just tell me, and I'll speak as loud as I can. Um, I have a number of. Uh, I'm sorry. I have a number of uh, of items for a vote. Um, uh, I'll just run through them as quickly as I can. Uh, we had a, a street naming request um, for the corner of Driggs and Sutton Street. Uh, in honor of platoon sergeant John H. Kojinecki. Uh He was a casualty of the invasion of Okinawa during World War II. Um, and uh, there's a group in Long Island, um, or sorry, in uh, Staten Island, uh, that works with uh, school kids to, um, you know, keep uh, 
keep the heroes that we've lost alive in the memories um, of our of our kids. And uh, this is part of that project. Um, he, um, uh, Mr. Hushnaki, uh grew up on Sutton Street. Um, he still has uh, some distant family uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, the family is gonna reach out to the Polish Slavic Center and um, some other organizations to, and um, one of our uh, uh, non-board member committee members who's um, active in PS 110 um, is gonna connect them to, uh, to do some work with their kids, uh, should the should the co naming go through and have them attend the the um, uh, the co naming uh, ceremony, so uh, there was a motion uh, to recommend uh, to recommend to community or one the approval of the co name and DOT the approval of the co naming of the corner of Sutton Street and Driggs Avenue in honor of Platoon Sergeant John E. Koshnaki, and that was um, approved unanimously without abstention. And I need a, a motion. I'll make a motion, Phil Caponegro. In Vega, second. Phil and, and Vega, roll call vote, please. Okay, I just wanted to make sure the renaming of the street to what, Eric? Uh, sorry, so it's... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, to recommend... Yeah, to recommend to community board one and Department of Transportation, the approval of the co-naming of the corner of Sutton Street and Driggs Avenue in honor of platoon Sergeant John E. Hojnecki, and it's H-O-J-N-A-C-K-I. Okay, thank you. But I can, I can forward this to you later, Sonia, for the well, Yeah, because I'm yeah. going to go crazy here. Gotta sure. I got to submit that tomorrow, so tomorrow. thank you. Okay. okay. It's in the report, but go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gina Argento? Sonia, Gina is on, but her audio is not working. Is she yes? Is she checked? Yes, I should give you guys my number. my number. Because that way they could text she's me gonna, straight. She's going to email she's you. Email so. email you. Okay, thank you. Um, Barnum Bacalowski? Yes. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Phil Caponegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Chinchelli. Teresa Sincara. Stephanie Cuevas. Ron and Daly. Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Yes. You, Arthur Dimanowski. Yes. Yes. Lloyd Feng. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. yes. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Denny Horowitz. Yes. Tony Iglesias. Yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. No. 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 Rosina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kilterborn. Yes. William Clasbo. William Clasbo. Joe Lando. Marie Liaza. Yes. Joe Lowe. Trina McKeever. Yes. You? Adam Myers. Yes. Sante Michelli. No. Tommy Moskowitz. Toby. Yes. Yes. Bye bye, David Needleman. Yes. Karen Nieves. Mary Adamerick. Yes. Janice Peterson, Bella Sables, Isaac Sofer, Isaac Sofer. Huh. Yes, Isaac Sofer. Yes. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser.
29 yes, two no, civil abstention, civil recusal, motion carries. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the second item was a discussion on uh, the district needs statement. Um, it uh, got a little muddled, um, but uh, because all last year we talked about doing the district, uh, updating the district needs for transportation. Um, we we kept trying to put it on the agenda for the regular meeting, but it, because of all the chaos on the agenda items, it didn't happen. So we are, I suggested that um, that we form a uh, that we ask the chair to form a subcommittee uh, for transportation um, district needs that would meet uh, uh, between now and let's say June before the um, the regular board uh, adjourns for the summer. Um, it was the sense of the committee um, that that was a good idea. Um, there were um, uh, two members that uh, did. Did not agree with that that proposal, um, but it did pass. Um, but of course, all committees are at the discretion of the chair, and so it was strictly a sense of the committee that we thought it was important to impanel a subcommittee to discuss district needs. I did it. I did listen in on the executive committee meeting um, that was the next night. Uh, I didn't. I didn't attend, but I was. I I watched the next day. I heard some misrepresentations about what was happening at the meeting, but I just want to say for the hundredth time, like I said, a hundred times during the transportation committee meeting that if this is a sense of the committee that we think that this is important to do. There's a lot of capital uh, improvements that need to happen with transportation. There's some, uh, so there's a lot in there that could be updated that need to be updated. It's a different uh, transportation array than, than we're, than we've been used to even in the last five years. Um, now, I, I heard the chair at the executive committee uh, say that she didn't think um, that we could fit it in with the number of meetings that we have. Um, if we want to do a working group, we need to do something separate from the transportation committee to get into the weeds on these issues. So I'll just say that um, and, I'll, and I'll leave it there. Although we did, uh, <clears throat> the committee also voted um, that uh, should uh, Chair Fuller decide that it is a good idea to impanel a subcommittee on transportation district needs. Um, that Paul Kelterborn, who's been doing um, work assembling a list and going through the old district needs statement, um, uh, that he would be appropriate to chair that committee. I've talked to Gina Barros a number of times about uh, the district needs statement. Uh, whatever is the chair's decision, and we'll we'll talk about that following this meeting. Um, uh, we will be putting a working group together one way or another to get this out um, so that we can get it to uh, Gina by the summer so that she can fit it into the full district needs statement. Um, and uh, I look forward to doing that. But I just want to be clear that it is only at the discretion of the chair that these committees are formed. So any misrepresentations to that end, I, I just want to clear that up right now. I'm so sorry, Eric. Sorry for inter interruption. Yes. We've got to be mindful. We've got to look at our bylaws. It's not at the discretion for these committee. It's that she appoints the chair. That's correct. Now, if you guys make a motion and you put it on the floor to vote, if you had enough people, then you put it on the floor and let the full board vote on it. Because it's either the chair, you look at the bylaws, you guys have to read your bylaws, please. I serve on the bylaws, we've got to be very careful. And yes. We've got to get informed. It so does I, say, I, go ahead. it does say the chair or the board, but if it's a recommendation based on the motion to create a committee, then it goes to the full board. If you guys did that at your meeting, you could present it as a motion. But please, guys, do yourselves a favor and read the bylaws. Well, it, it was, uh, you know, well, I mean, I don't know. So we did, we did vote on, on two separate items. One, um, uh, that was uh, seconded by, uh, vice chair wiser to, uh, to do the subcommittee. Um, but, um, 
it's a vote if if uh, if anybody wants to make that motion. I don't want to add to any confusion or idea. Um, it is in the bylaws that the chair does or the board, um, but it was a sense of the committee that we would recommend to Chair Fuller that she impanel it or not. So I, I you know, I just want to be clear on that. Uh, even, even in the report, it states that uh, this is not um, meant to be a vote for the full board, but it is a sense of the committee. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I have another motion. I have another item that needs a vote. But if, Can I make a comment, Eric? Yes, please. I, I sit on two very busy committees, on the Land Use Committee and on the Environmental Committee, and the district needs statement and the work that Gina's done on it is, is so vital, and it's really important for committees to prioritize what they want, and often in the course of regular committee meetings, there just isn't time to do that, and so I think it's something a, across the board, so to speak, that we should think about with with the busy com committees that, that maybe they can, maybe a smaller working group can be impaneled to work on the district needs and present back to their committees and just to, to make sure we don't let another year go by without really um, doubling down on the district needs statement. Uh, so can I, this is Del T, can I, I, I was at the executive committee meeting and um, Eric, just just to, to make it clear for everyone, the at least the majority of the people on the executive committee felt that it would be a good idea for you to have a working group. And that way, you know, you, you, you could have a working group, you can set it up however you want. You don't necessarily have to, you don't necessarily have to then have um, WebEx meetings and, and, and treat it and fit it in somehow, you know, with a separate meeting, you would have a working group and then the working group would come back and, and uh, report back to the full committee and then the full committee could deal with the situation. So just, just to clarify, I, I think that um, we did, we were very supportive um, of having a working committee and um, having whatever, whoever you want to, to, to be um, leading that committee or taking the the, the, the lead on that committee. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Del. Yeah, I, I did hear those comments and, you know, a working group would be fine, um, but just given all the, you know, craziness that goes on in the transportation committee between members and the public and everything else, I thought maybe a subcommittee, but a working group would be perfectly appropriate. We would take it up as a full agenda item in June, or we're, I guess it would have to be May uh, to get it to the, to the, um, well, it, it doesn't really need a vote of the board, right? It just needs to go to the budget committee. But um, anyway, to, to get it done, I just want to get this done by June. Like it, we want to try to do this all last year. It needs separate attention because it's a granular list. It's, it's a little bit different than some of the other district needs um, in certain ways that it just deserves, you know, full attention. You know, to to get it done, and and I've even spoken to Gina, and Gina uh, had said that she would she had hoped that other committees would would do something like not not a subcommittee, but maybe a working group or something to submit uh, a more fulsome uh, list of district needs. Um, so you know, look, I'm <laughs> I just want to get it done, right? So I don't care if it's a subcommittee, I don't care if it's a working group. It just has to get done. It has to get done correctly, and. Um, and that was it. I, I brought it up because it was part of the meeting. We did vote on it. Um, and I just wanted to be, you know, fully clear what the intention was. So without any misrepresentation. So that's it. But thank you, Del. May I ask, Eric, you're so you're talking about a subcommittee of the transportation um, committee, right? You're not talking about a district needs subcommittee. No, no, no. It's a temporary committee of the transportation committee just to assemble a district needs statement. And yeah, it probably. Hey. And it would probably be a one time thing because, uh, or uh, not a one time thing, but one time thing to get it right uh, and, and nailed down this year so that we can only make minor adjustments um, in, the, in the following in the following years. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say that we have had similar conversations in parks where it comes up and perhaps too late um, in the year, even though it seems like it's months in advance that there just aren't any dates left for additional meetings to yeah. review. The needs and so I, I, especially because there is also overlap on so many committees, you know, I, 
parks and, and transportation is one of them, environmental protection and land use, you know, there's just so many that, per, you know, perhaps a, um, um, a committee, a board wide um, subcommittee or working group could be of use here. Well, I mean, there, there's genus committee and, um, you know, a lot of that work can and should be done there. Um, and Gina's done amazing work to, to put that together. Um, but that's a, that's a, a full plate for, for Gina. So I just want to, you know, we are the transportation committee. We do understand these issues and just to like, you know, get something to her that's digestible that we can, you know, work with her on, uh, so that she doesn't have to, you know, do a lot of extra work to, to hash that out. But thanks, Katie. I appreciate that comment. Um, as a, as a, I just want to say, as a member of uh, Gina's committee, um, I, I appreciate that that any your committee and any other committee wants to put you know give give some attention to what you really would like us to add to the um, the district needs statement. I mean, I think it's important. Uh, and again, if you have a if you set up a, a working uh, group, you don't. You don't need to have anyone's um, permission or approval for that. So yes, I'm I'm very supportive of of input. You know, when we sit down and finally have to yeah. do that budget, it's it's really good to have uh, specific input from the, the committee. Thanks, thanks, Del. I was I was gonna bring this up uh, before this meeting, but I wanted to just have it in the report and get it out. For the full board, and then I will follow up with chair fuller, um, either this week or next and um, we'll we'll move forward that way. I, I'm not going to ask for a vote for the board to approve this. I think, um, I think the case has been made that it's an important thing. Um, and I'll discuss it with chair fuller uh, offline. So, right. if, if there's no further discussion on this, I, I do have 1 more, um, a couple more items. Fine to go. Okay, good. Um, and thank you everybody for. For that, um, so, uh, we went into, oh, God, I lost my place. Sorry, just bear with me 1 second. Uh, old business, old business, old business. Um, okay, so, uh, we had another fatality, um, on the 28th. Of December. Um, at the corner of Grand and Graham, uh, a moped was, um, uh, hit and the rider was, um, was killed by a truck. And as, as we all know, any fatality on our streets, uh, results in a letter request, um, to the different agencies, uh, for an explanation of the status of the investigation. And so, uh, there was a motion. Um, boilerplate motion community board 1 to send a uh, its standard inquiry letter to NYPD highway patrol 90th precinct exo Vasquez, uh, district attorney Gonzalez with copies to borough president Reynoso council member Gutierrez, New York city department of transportation borough commissioner Bray as to the state of the investigation for the traffic fatality involving a moped and a truck at the intersection of grand street and Graham Avenue on December 28th. 2022, and that was unanimous without abstention. I need a vote. I'll make a motion, Trina. Make a second. Second, it, Julia. Thank you, William and Trina and William. Trina, right? Trina and Vega, roll call vote, please. Gina Argento. Baden Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bomanti. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Bill Capernegro. Yes. Hank Cabone. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Chinchelli. Teresa Sincado. Stephanie Cuevas. Juan and Daly. Giovanni De Amado. Yes. Evan Drinkwater. Yes. Arthur Dibonaski. Yes. Lloyd Feng. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. The Alice, oh, Crystal Garcia. Crystal Garcia. 
Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Danny Horowitz. Yes. Sonny Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Bonzina, uh, Bonzina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kilterborn. Yes. William Clasvold. Joe Orlando. Marie Liaza. Yes. Joe Lowe. Trina McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Dante Michelli. Yes. Toby Markowitz. Rabbi David Needleman. Karen Nieves. Mary Adamerick. Yes. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sofer. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Viera. Maria Viera. Yes. Simon Weiser. Uh, Frank Carbone, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Twenty-seven yes, civil no, civil abstention, civil recusal. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, there was quite a bit of old business, but I'll just uh, highlight uh, thanks to uh, Councilmember Ressler for bringing up Commercial Street. That's on our plate currently. Um, and then um, new business. Um, uh, we uh, we talked about um, the uh, uh, two ten Greenpoint Avenue. The 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 gas station site that uh, Steve referenced. Um, we're still looking for a better. It, it's uh, Rhonda sent it out for inspection. It passed inspection, but we're not happy with it. Someone's going to die at that corner. So we need to keep working on that and um, get the sub eight subdivisions of uh, DOT to to get the uh, contractor to do something better. Um, and then the last <clears throat> item of new business, uh, which uh, took up quite a bit of time. Um, I think a lot of you will know that um, uh, the Puerto Rican community was very upset um, about the uh, removal of the Avenue of Puerto Rico signs on Graham Avenue. Um, I did my own little investigation. Um, you know, it it was just a it was just a stupid thing to do. You know, there's no clear answer <laughs> from DOT. Like, was it a mistake? Is it a citywide thing? We don't know. We still are trying to figure that out, but it doesn't matter. Um, it was a huge slap in the face uh, to the to the Puerto Rican community, um, especially with all the controversy around Moore Street Market that's gone on over the years and everything else. Um, it was just like the stupidest thing the city could have done was to take down those signs. And uh, William and I went to a, a rally. We met some of the organizers of the coalition um, that Saturday after it happened. Uh, we talked to a lot of folks. Um, I, I thought that they were going to come and speak tonight. So I just want to, uh, if any of them are on the call, I just want to make sure that you understand that this board, and I, I want to let you know that I got calls, um, uh, from a couple board members about this item. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we hear, we hear that you want an apology. We hear that you want a better explanation. And to that end, um, there was a motion, uh, that community board one should send a letter to New York city. DOT Commissioner um, Rodriguez asking for a detailed explanation of the process that resulted in the removal of the Avenue of Puerto Rico along the Graham Avenue, Gra sorry, Avenue of Puerto Rico signs along the Graham Avenue cor corridor, and that was unanimous without abstention. I make a motion, and I wanted to Sonia, say the Latino community. The Latino community was offending, not only the Puerto Rican. I, I yes, that's true, but. Uh, Yes, absolutely. But um, we, we heard we heard from him. So I second it. So, yeah. And thank you, Sonia, for calling me that morning. I really appreciate it. 
No, thank you, Eric. I appreciate you much. Appreciate it. everyone in my community are so grateful to you. Thank you, Eric. A thousand thank yous. No problem. The least I could do. Who made the motion? Who said it? Uh, no, Sonia second. I made the motion. I <laughs> I was made it Sonia second. <laughs> okay, roll call vote. Gina Argento. Martin Bakowski. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Phil Capernegro. Yes. Frank Cabone. Yes. Steven Chesler. Yes. Michael Cincelli. Teresa Sercado. Stephanie Cuevas, Juan and Daly, Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Arthur Dibinaski. Yes. Lloyd Fang. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. <laughs> Crystal Garcia. Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein. Joe Gross. David Holmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Denny Horowitz. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sony Iglesias, yes. Moses Indy. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. Bozina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kulterborn. Yes. William Clasbo. Yo Orlando. Marie Liaza. Yes. Thank you. Trina McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Dante Michelli. Mr. Yes. Santos. Toby Moskowitz. Rabbi David Niederman. Karen Nieves. Mary Adamerick. Yes. Dennis Peterson. Bella Sables. Isaac Sofer. LT. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Marie Vieira. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser. Ladies and gentlemen, 25 years, civil no, civil abstention, civil recusal. We're dangerously close, people. We're dangerously close. Thank you guys for your support. Thank you. Next next meeting, uh, Thursday, February 23rd. Thanks. Housing and public housing. Maria Vieira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And folks, thank you for staying on. Um, so I am happy to report that on January 3rd, 30th, I'm sorry, last Monday, the Housing and Public Housing Committee, I see, I see you, I see you, I see you, Julia. <laughs> the Housing and Public Housing Committee met to discuss this very egregious situation of the increase uh, that Krauss Management is imposing on the Bedford Gardens apartments. Um, as you heard earlier from council member Ressler, um, I think that all of the electeds in the district are opposing this um, egregious um, imposition and um, community board one, uh, there was a motion to pass a resolution to be sent to HPD opposing this rent increase. Um, I saw the, I mean, the resolution was passed this today or yesterday. I don't know if you all saw it. Did you, did you not? I'm happy to read it if you didn't. I ain't looking at you, Julia. I believe yeah. that it was circulated to everybody by email. It was circulated. Yes, we saw it today. Yep. Yes, yes. And, and we all know, you know, just to, to, to summarize, it's a 647 unit housing development, eight buildings. It's a Michelama. Uh, Krauss wants to increase the rent. The proposal is that they increase it by 25% 
this year, 2023, 25% in 2024, and another 15% in 2025. Who ever heard of that? That's crazy. Um, so um, we are asking that the full board supports the submission of this resolution to HPD opposing this incredibly egregious rent increase. Can I please have a motion to support this resolution? The motion that was I second the motion. Right. Wait a minute, guys. Who made the motion? We all second the motion. <laughs> we all, I just need one person. Julia made motion. the motion. Julia, who, who second? I didn't hear who second. I second. Is that a second? Guys, you got to help me here. Who made the motion? Julia Foster Julia made, made the motion. motion. Who seconded? I'll second. I second Iris Cabrera. Julia and Iris, roll call vote, please. Thank you. Gina Argento. Martin Bakarowski. Yes. Lisa Bamanti. Yes. Gina Barrows. Yes. Eric Rosides. Yes. Iris Cabrera. Yes. Phil Capronegro. Yes. Frank Cavone. Yes. Steve Chesler. Yes. Michael Cincelli, Teresa Sincara. Stephanie Cuevas, Juan and Daly, Giovanni D'Amato. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Arthur Dibinowski. Yes. Lloyd Frank. Julia Amanda Foster. Yes. Crystal Garcia. Joe Goldstein. Joe Groves. David Helmick. Yes. Sabrina Help. Katie Danny Horowitz. Yes. You, Sony Iglesias, yes. Moses Ending. Robert Jeffrey. Yes. You, Bonzina Kaminsky. Yes. Corey Canton. Yes. Paul Kilterborn. Yes. William Clasball. Joe Lando. Marie Liaza. Yes. Joe Lowe. Trina McKeever. Yes. Adam Myers. Yes. Dante Michelli. Yes. Tom Sobi Moskowitz. Rabbi David Niederman. Karen Nieves. Mary Domerick. Yes. Janet Peterson. Bella Sable. Isaac Sofer. Mr. Isaac. Del T. Yes. William Vega. Yes. Maria Vieira. Yes. Simon Weiser. Twenty-seven yes, it will no, so we'll sentence, it will recusal, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And that's it from the Housing and Public Housing Committee. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Women's Commission, Women's uh, Committee, Jane Poole. Turn on your mic, we can't hear you, Hi. Jane. Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, Jan is in Mexico, so I'm taking over here. Uh, so our report uh, last month, we had uh, Julia Salazar come to speak with us about the women's pavilion at Woodhall Hospital. She had um, gotten $3.5 million to um, help women with essential services, prenatal, general gynecological, STD testing treatments, genetic. So she's done a lot to help, and we thought it would be good to get the conversation going about what she needs there and um, and how to support um, women who need those services. And it just seems like there needs to be more connection between people who need the services and um, and further support and a lot of education. And so. Um, and Bella Sabelle noted that um, a woman from her community, from the Hasidic community, had um, 
birth the baby in that um, that center at Woodhall, and was really happy with the improvements that they've been making there. So um, we also um, to women swim. Uh, you know, some I think everyone knows some of their hours have been cut. So we are trying to get a, um, a meeting among the elected officials. Lincoln's been really helpful with that and with the Human Rights Commission, because we were told that that was the reason for cutting, that they were the ones who wanted to cut the hours, but they are saying that that is not the case. So we're trying to figure out why we can't kind of keep going back and forth with this issue and hopefully resolve that. Um, we also, um, Neighborhood Women, uh, Jan Peterson uh, founded that organization in the 70s. Most of you probably know about it. Um, but we are reinvigorating the organization. And we're kind of looking at what might be a good service to the community for a, a programming sort of thing to, <clears throat> you know, kind of invigorate the community. And we had seen the rise in street harassment around the community and, and a lot of division and a lot of people not getting along well and online harassment, various types of harassment. And there's an organization called Right to Be, which is formerly Hollaback. Uh, they teach people various types of de-escalation of uh, aggressive harassment. And many of their trainings are uh, some are general, just street harassment, bystander intervention training, but some are customized for, uh, you know, teenagers, LGBTQIA, um, uh, all different types of people, people in work, bars, they train bartenders. So we're looking to sort of uh, train a lot of different types of people throughout the community and connect with um, organizations. So I've talked to the Y, um, the library and, you know, a lot of different organizations in the community and anyone who's interested, please reach out to me. Um, but we are looking to do kind of a campaign in the community and right to be is amazing. So I think that'll be a nice, uh, <clears throat> a nice thing to do. And I tried to keep all of that short because, um, a project that. Many of you know that I've been working on with my friend Jane Lee, who is on and some other, we have a, a nice little team of us who've been working. Uh, we've, you know, Jan has done a lot to bring women's history to about this community here. And I met her because I started working on a project years ago um, that's been slow going because of other projects uh, called the All Along Project. And what we're, we're looking at is the fact that uh, there's very little representation of women in history in America and Brooklyn and uh, North Brooklyn. And so we thought we'd like to start um, here to pilot a project to kind of bring women's history more uh, into the community. And um, I guess the, the way it came into my head, I'll just give a quick spiel as I was giving my nieces directions driving into the city and I heard, my, heard myself saying, okay, take the George Washington Bridge down the Henry Hudson Parkway past Lincoln Center, Javits Center to the Joe DiMaggio Parkway. And if the traffic is bad, take the FDR to the Ed Koch Bridge or the uh, RFK Bridge, either way you're going to the Kosciuszko Bridge and, you know, and everything is named after men. And, we thought mm, my daughter's gone to four schools, Oliver Perry, Samuel DuPont, Eugenio de Hostess, and Fred Fiorella LaGuardia. And, you know, we're not angry, but we're saying, what, what could we do that could maybe, you know, mitigate some of this lopsided um, representation? So Jane, um, we're gonna put a little presentation up and talk a little bit about this to share this. We'd like to start um, a committee in the community. So this is kind of an, outreach and um, we'd like for, you know, recommendations too. And Jane, you can start talking now. If, uh, so introducing Jane Lee. Am I, am I muted? Okay, now I'm unmuted, okay. Sorry, it's always new, new ways of um, working. So, hi, I'm Jane, I'm friends with Jane. We're very creative in our friend name choices, apparently. <laughs> um, 
but we've been working on this project together, uh, Jane, pipe in whenever you want. Um, I'm an architect. I'm based in Greenpoint. Um, I have been for a few years. I live in Greenpoint as well. Um, so the project is called the All Along Project, um, basically to honor women who have been there all along and working for our communities all along. Um, and I'll try to keep this brief. I know it's late and uh, probably a lot of you just want to go to bed or call it quits <laughs> tonight. Um, so it's a, um, uh, a project that's sort of proposing an easy um, system of markers that can be installed in sort of existing New York City green infrastructure without taking away the fact that they are in fact green infrastructure. Um, we're not sort of lofty enough to think that we can come up with a new park space, which is at a hot commodity. It's more of like finding ways to honor people and sort of um, subtle insertions um, or insistent insertions into into existing green spaces. Um, we did a lot of research um, and have found that um, in all of our public spaces, only 6% of stations nation nationwide include a female figure. But if you remove those figures, like the fictional figures, like Alice in Wonderland or Lady Liberty, uh, Lady Victory, it's only 0.3% um, of all statues in the United States honor women. I think that's astounding. It is. And there, and a lot of them are the same women over and over, obviously. I mean, same with men, but there's, you know, when you're only a 0.3%, your, <laughs> your numbers get a little smaller. Um, so we're sort of seeking to, to integrate women and women's history and women's accomplishments into sort of the everyday infrastructure around us so it becomes more more part of the kind of known historical fact and more part of the known kind of community impact that different women have had um in new york 1.9 percent of parks playgrounds and monuments are dedicated to women and only seven statues directly represent women who are not fictional and if i go back to the previous slide you'll see that Women are only just slightly over animals, which is, um, we did beat them, which is exciting, but not um, significantly. Right. And there are uh, temporary statues that have gone up, but for permanent statues, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are monumental women, and, um, and there are a couple of uh, organizations that are adding, I think 10 more statues are slated to be added, which is great, but it still uh, has us way behind. So. Yeah, and it's great. And I think the other thing that uh, has sort of struck us as we worked on this project is it's great to honor sort of like the big historical women who have had an impact, but there's so many ways that uh, people, but women's like in this project, women who are not kind of like the big names that everybody talks about, but have transformed communities. Like I'm sure we can all think of examples in North Brooklyn alone. And um, this is sort of proposing a way of also honoring those women. Like not every single person has to be, um, you know, uh, Betsy Ross, who's the one that we found the most statues of, but it could also be like a really great um, civil rights, you know, civic organizer, you know, community organizer, somebody who has like a very big community impact. Well, one, um, just from working on this project, I'll interject here. Uh, you know, the, the, I was trying to Google like, okay, what are great women of North Brooklyn, of Greenpoint or Williamsburg? And, you know, the, the Google doesn't just give you the name. So it's really hard to find these people. And this grassroots way of getting the idea out is how I'm learning about who these historical women are and Jeffrey Cobb, our local historian. But aside from that, it's, it's really hard. <clears throat> and through the women's committee, I learned about Sister Frances Cress now, many of you, because we did start through North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, we did start a, um, an annual award dedicated to Sister Frances Cress. But those of you who don't know her, she was a nun who in the 1970s uh, really made the connection between the contaminants in the Newtown Creek and the cancer clusters. And she was making a lot of noise to try to do something about this. And she was shut down. She got herself a hazmat suit. So this was a nun in a hazmat suit who was jumping the fences, collecting samples, and eventually got the, the attention of Mayor Ed Koch and co-founded the Department of Environmental Protection and later won the Congressional Medal of Honor because her work was so integral to the, um, to the Clean Water Act. 
And so Sister Frances Cress lived and died, died in Greenpoint just a few years ago. I'd never heard of her. I fought that power plant for eight and a half years, done lots of environmental justice, never heard about her. And it's, I, we could have honored her, gotten her stories, but we're honoring her now because I feel like that's that's pretty big contribution to our neighborhood. This kind of grassroots organizing is, is a way that a lot of women organize. And some of these, um, so we're looking at path, you know, maybe a path in a park or a public space, a public privately owned space or a pier or a plaza. So this is something we'll be, um, you know, needing to talk with parks and DOT. And we've started the conversation and it will be political too. So we're going to need community support to do this. Um, but we think this could really um, make our uh, history richer and more interesting. Um, yeah, so and even I, as, just as a start, you know, we sort of started identifying different um, green streets, privately owned public spaces, public parks, like just sort of mapping them in North Brooklyn alone to sort of like look at different possibilities. Which is not to say that these are all the possibilities. We 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 just sort of started our work, and we would love um, ideas from the community or um, um, site suggestions, or even like a completely different mode of thinking about it. But we started to come up with like a sort of different ideas of how these things could look, and they could just be signs inserted in a garden like this. Um, but you could. Uh, scan the sign with your phone for like a QR code or something that would give you a history of that person. Uh, and then ultimately it would all be on sort of a digital map so you could navigate the city looking at all of these different locations and you could also kind of get an idea of things that happened in different uh, neighborhoods at different times and they could all be linked together through an app and through like a, an online map. But we're we're still just looking to pilot the first one, obviously. But that's our vision for the future. Um, also, like sort of through this this toolkit, like we're saying, women in this instance, and that's what our initiative is. But we also think this could be a model for other communities to to honor people that they think are uh, worthy of honoring. Like it could be veterans, or it could be. You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm just coming up. It's very late for me, by the way. I get up very early in the morning, so this is like bedtime. Um, so, and these are, you know, a few other ideas. Like you could just, they could just be very simple little signs that attach to railings, existing railings along the waterfront, or I guess perhaps seawalls. Based on past conversation in this in this call, we could build a whole seawall out of brick. <laughs> Um, or they could be sort of paths that are in uh, parks and it's not something that would take away from the nature of any green space at all. It's just adding a layer of information and history that could be sort of uh, make the fabric of our city a little bit richer. Yeah. Oh, there's <clears throat> and we're, we're looking at, at diverse com our diverse community where we are and we kind of feel like, oh, I mean, love to pilot finding a place on the south side, finding a place near Cooper Park houses, finding a place in Greenpoint, finding a place, you know, just finding a, a few different places where we could have these interventions that would really tell stories of women. And then the online database, um, we met a, a, we have a, a kind of genius tech guy friend who created the algorithms for how Lyft charges people. And he's got, you know, He's, I, I don't understand any of his Google Scholar articles. He's kind of a genius, but um, he has a user-friendly concept for how we could have an online ladies, database ladies, that could, could be added. Please summarize oh. the hours okay. late and we still have other business. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Um, so we'd like, um, I don't know what, how we, uh, we're gonna, we'd like to set up um, committee meetings uh, next month to start um, searching for, you know, the names of women that people would like to propose, put a committee together for that and just get this um, piloted and going in this community. And we're also going to be doing a Kickstarter campaign pretty soon. So if anyone is interested, I'll put my information in the chat and um, any comments or questions or um, I know it's late, but thank you recommendations. I could meet with other committees if that makes sense. Parks, DOT, anyone. Um, but I'll put my name in the chat and thank you. 
you can you can send your information yeah. to the community board along with your presentation if you'd like. Okay, that'd be we'll great. We'll send it out to the rest of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was a great presentation. I wish you all the success. Thank you very much. Nice You're job. Um, that concludes committee reports. Parks as written. Um, Electeds. Bruno Daniels from the Borough President's Office. Uh, hello, Chair Fuller. Um, How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm here to respond to the request for questions on the proposed rules. Um, I know it's late. We can do that another time. I, I'm seeing people already like, <laughs> I, we can do that another time um, or we can do it now. It's completely up to you. Yeah, I know it's late. Uh, do anybody want, want to talk about the proposed rules that the borough president's coming out with? And there's a comment section. Said, um, when is the last date for the comment session, Bruno? When is the last date to comment, make comments? Um, there's a good amount of time because the hearing won't be till March, and I think it'll be towards the later part of March. We don't even have uh, the email set up yet to receive it, so there is a good amount of time. Okay, good. Does anybody anybody that read the uh, proposed uh, proposal have any uh, questions that they're dying to ask Bruno? Apparently, nobody I read, it. read it. I read it, Madam Chair, but um, I'm fried. I can also set aside a time with a smaller group of people, like a small working group that really wants to do that. Um, just email me directly, or I can email in the morning, Chair Fuller. Okay, let's try to get a consensus from the board. Would you like for Bruno to come back to the full board, or maybe go to a committee meeting? I, yeah, I would Jenny. like him to come back. I would like. I, I would love it if uh, if uh, this could be uh, an item on our agenda. Yeah, the presentation early in the day because it's very important, Mr. Bruno. Yes, yes, I suggest yes, that think, we get yeah, him early. Yeah. Okay, well, my suggestion is that we'll have you back and we'll put you on the public hearing session. Sounds great. Is that fine? Thank you. Uh, did Thank, that you. Fine Thank you, Bruno. Thank no you problem. So much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. All. Okay, thank you so much, Bruno. For hanging on, Bruno. Okay. I got a text from Daniel Wiley. He, uh, is a district manager for I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, I'm good. going about my list. Thank you. Um, Miranda from Assemblywoman Gallagher's office. Okay. Senator Christian Gonzalez's office. Marissa. Hi there. The senator is actually just trying to connect and it's not letting her into the meeting. Oh. Is she still trying to get on? She is, yes. Um, I don't know. Is she using the same email that you use to try to get on? Yes, she is. If you wouldn't mind just giving us one minute while she just figures this out. Well, I'll call. I'll call the next speaker. And I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Gutierrez's office. Uh, Abraham Lugo. Lugo still on? Oh. That's everybody's bedtime. Uh, Daniel Wiley from uh, Congresswoman uh, Velasquez's office. Daniel Wiley. You may need to be uh, unmuted. Oh, okay, thank you. I just, I just got elevated. Uh, I was listening to the State of the Union on my other ear. Um, I'm pinch hitting for uh, Evelyn Cruz. Uh, she and I are both district directors. Excuse me, Sam. Are both district, my son. Uh, we're both district directors for Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. It's great to have uh, more of Community Board 1 in our district. Um, the Congresswoman is looking forward uh, to seeing you all 
uh, join us on February 23rd. That's a Thursday that Lincoln mentioned, Ressler mentions that we're working closely with uh, and all the local elected officials uh, to bring the Army Corps of Engineers uh, here uh, to the Brooklyn waterfront, Triskelion Arts on 106 Callier, Callier Street from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, and that will be uh, giving an opportunity for uh, folks to better understand uh, the, um, the study that they're doing on flood protection and what uh, what's being proposed at least preliminarily, but still is far, far off from being a real design yet. Uh, and we're going to be joined by uh, Santa Cruz Gonzalez and Emily Gallagher, as well as Lincoln Wrestler and folks from the Queens side, um, Councilman Julie Wan. And, you know, Newtown Creek Alliance, North Brooklyn Neighbors, Bushwick Inlet Park, um, North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, even Hunters Point Parks Conservancy will participate and have an opportunity in this forum uh, to give their specific feedback and help people put in comments, which are due March 7th uh, for the record. Um, so that's coming up. And thanks to everyone. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm also looking forward to reading Steve Chesler, uh, his, um, his tome. <laughs> uh, but uh, these concerns are something everyone should come out for. Um, I also want to express the congressman's dismay uh, at the um, shooting that occurred at Williamsburg houses. Um, you know, she's going to keep fighting uh, the iron pipeline and uh, is looking together uh, to put together some dialogue. She just got funding in community uh, funding projects uh, for the WIC um, for anti violence um, services. Uh, throughout the district, uh, so that's coming down the pike. So anyway, from Carson Velasquez, I don't want to uh, take any more of your time, but thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome, uh, Daniel. In the future, we send out an email to all the electives to sign up and speak before two o'clock on the day of the mm -hmm. meeting. So our meetings always, you know, first two, whatever. You can look at our calendar, but I didn't have your name because you didn't oh. sign up. Yeah, that's my bad. And Evelyn usually does cover, but like I'm saying, pitch pitch hitting for her. But we'll 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 get. Thank it. you so much for pitching in. For I appreciate it. Yeah. And for staying on yeah. so late. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Marissa, did the uh, Marissa did the uh, senator get on? Yes, senator is with us he, now. Hi everyone. Hi, Senator Gonzalez. Hi, nice to see you all. Um, <laughs> I uh, apologize in advance. This is going to be a little shorter than I anticipated because the place I am in is currently closing. So I'm about to get kicked out. Um, but I just wanted to pop on, say hi, and give you some quick dates on how our first month has been in Albany. Um, so as you all know, um, you know, we were inaugurated and uh, sworn in earlier this earlier last month, but we got our committee assignments. Uh, I am now chairing Internet and technology. I'm also on the transportation committee, disabilities, energy and telecommunications, which is really exciting from an environmental justice standpoint, ethics um, and uh, consumer protection. Excited with this, you know, suite of committees to fight for uh, more of our priorities around environmental justice, as I mentioned, but also around data and privacy, because I think that's something that as activists should be front of mind. Um, in the last month, you know, it started with the fight against LaSalle, which, you know, I was the first senator to come out against LaSalle as our court for appeals pick. Um, it then went into a lot of organizing work. We were supporting NYSNA and other unions in their efforts um, and then transitioned into um, right now as we're preparing for budget. Uh, starting to meet with other electeds, both in our overlaps, but also, um, you know, in, in the state Senate to begin, you know, mapping out our priorities and what we'll be advocating for. So some of those include, for example, um, the first bill that we proposed called the uh, Personal Privacy Protection Modernization Act, which closes a loophole and requires law enforcement to have a warrant whenever they're receiving data, our personal data from state agencies, um, but also includes, for example, uh, you know, this weekend I met with 
our overlapping Brooklyn electeds and Senator Gillibrand to talk about um, ensuring that we are pushing for a road diet on McGinnis Boulevard, um, talking about the Army Corps plan and ensuring that our waterfront remains renewable. I know we have a town hall coming up um, with Assembly Member Gallagher and City Council Member Lincoln Ressler on the same, which is incredibly important. We've also been pushing for our energy priorities to so the Build Public Renewables Act, but to reduce um, fossil fuel infrastructure. One thing that I spoke on in the energy committee specifically was to ensure that um, the fracked gas vaporizers, of course, we're not coming back online, but that we aren't investing in any more fossil fuel infrastructure across not only in Brooklyn, but across the city and state. Um, so we're being very clear about our priorities. Um, I'm going to stop there because, again, it, I'm a little bit on the shorter end, but um, I do want to take any questions if folks have. Or if there are any specific things you you all would like for me to speak to so that I can um I can make sure I cover it today. Anybody have any questions for the senator? No, don't hear any. Thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you. Have a good evening. Of you course. Good work. Thank you all so much. Um please stay tuned on office. I do want to shout out uh I have Marissa from our team on the call, so she's Happy to take any. If a question does come up, please reach out to us. We're here. We're staffed up and, and ready to go. So we will. Thank we look all. forward to working with you in your office. Look forward to working with all of you. And thank you all so much. Okay. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Thank you. Likewise. Is there any old business? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. This is Mary. I have two items that I would like to bring up for old business. Uh, speaking of fabulous women, I want to bring to your attention uh, and honor the memory of Irene Klementovich, who passed away uh, in January. She was an environmental pioneer in our neighborhood. And also in January, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney left office, and uh, she was uh, representing us for several years in North Brooklyn and brought in a lot of good work. So I'd like to honor her as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank Congressman for how good all her work she did for us. Is there any other uh, old business? Yes, please, Steve Chesler. Yeah, can we please get an update on the district manager position fulfillment? We'll begin the, we'll begin the process of interviews. We're setting them up. We got a nice. Uh, um, yeah, we got a substantial amount of applications. Any other questions? Any new business? No new business. I mean, no uh, new business. I'd like to thank everybody for their patience tonight. It's been a trying meeting, but we all hung in there. And I know the hour was late, so I'd just like to thank everybody for their patience and all the hard work that they're doing. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Accept it. Meet and adjourn. <laughs> be healthy. Be safe, everybody. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.